Okay, it's 6 o'clock, June 17, 2013, and time to call this regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of the San Felipe Del Rio CISD Order. Mr. Overfeld, we have a quorum, correct? Yes, sir, we do. Let the record show that a quorum of the board members is present, that this meeting's been duly called, and then notice that this meeting's been posted to this Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. At this time, if you'd stand for opening ceremonies. Just a moment of silence to reflect in your own way. And now the Pledge of Allegiance. Brings us to agenda item four, public comments. Ms. Falcone, were there any public comments? No public comments at this time. Before we go any further, uh, before we go to agenda item five, information items, just a reminder, as the agenda says very clearly, uh, items do not have to be taken in the same order as shown on the notice. Um, and there was a request, if the board would allow, Discussion and possible action of agenda item 8D, which is Valvery Appraisal District Resolution to amend the 2013 budget. If we, could, if we are willing to move that up and discuss and act on it at this time. So that's purely the board's decision. Uh, Mr. Chavita, do you have a... Uh, it would be, the request is to move agenda item discussion Action item 8D. It's a good reason. I mean, what? It says it's not. Uh, do, you, do you? I don't have any problem as long as we don't continue to do men because uh, everybody's got to wear drag. Mr. Mesa, do you have any objections? You'd be okay with it and still sign? I'm fine. Mr. Overfill? It's fine by me. It's fine okay. as well. Okay, Dr. Reyes, did you have something to add? No. Please keep in favor. Okay. I'll stick that. Okay. If there's no more discussion on it, we keep you the recommendation is to just keep it separate. But I don't see there being any discussion on this particular item. Okay. Okay. Ms. Falcone, if you let the record show, we're going to move discussion action item 8. D. We're going to discuss and act on that at this time, and then we'll get back to the regular order of the agenda. So discussion action item 8D, Valverde Appraisal District Resolution to amend the 2013 budget by retaining surplus funds from 2012 in the amount of $95,525. Ms. Valdez. Good evening, Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, board members. In your packet was included the resolution from the Valverde Appraisal District to retain the excess funds of 95,525 from their 2012 audit to amend into their 2013 budget. And I believe there's a representative here from the Appraisal District. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Ms. Sheedy's here if you have any questions. request from the appraisal district is to retain the surplus funds in order to repair the leaky roof on the district's building and to purchase a 4x4 pickup truck. 
the estimates of the roof are alone exceed about $60,000. of the entities uh, is required to vote or not vote within 30 days of receiving the resolution. It's the same resolution? The same funds? It would be the same excess, but each entity has a different amount depending on their, their uh, taxing value. How often does this happen? Since I've been here every year, they've had excess. Last year, our portion was 140629 which was used to pay off the building note. This is, will be the third time, right? That we have a, a director. Do you want to bring her up sure, here? Sure, so okay. I don't know. Good evening. This, this will be the <coughs> third time that uh, you requested that the money be used. What was the first time? Correct. The... Uh, First time was to pay off the building note. And the second time? The second time, gosh, I wish I could remember. Um, Do you remember? The first one was to pay off. The first one was the pay down because we had two notes. The second one was to pay completely off. And this, and, and the 92 is not completely. It's not the whole. It's, it's just the total, and our share will be a lot smaller than that. Your share is $44,391.09. And just to make a correction, the 140000 last year wasn't your share. That was everything. Okay. That was total. Yeah. And, um, and this will be used for what purpose? To replace the roof. We're having roof issues where it's leaking. We have the flat tar and gravel, and we chase the leaks every time major rains. The other purpose was for a 4x4. Four four. There's parts of the county that we cannot get to in our regular vehicles. So we're concerned um, that we might be missing improvement values out there because we can't get to them. Yeah, because I know the problem, the leaking problem has been there for It's been sometime. there for some time. Mr. Mosser? Any problem? Sorry. <coughs> um, if I may add a couple of things, I, I sit on the board along with the other board members um, that are present here. Um, it, it serves, uh, well, first of all, we, the budget that is, uh, again, uh, for the appraisal district, uh, we have a surplus every year, which is a plus. We do not overspend. Um, and so this money is left over, and it benefits all the entities in that we are no longer paying the note that we used to pay uh, with interest. The building is paid off. Uh, there is a problem with the roof. Uh, it, it's you know, one of those flat roofs and it doesn't have, you know, a pitch to it. And so it, you know, it is leaked. Um, it, we have replaced carpet. We have uh, replaced some furniture that has been damaged. And so the recommendation has been to, you know, kind of redo the whole roof. And then um, an architect decided, like, I think it might, might have been a city inspector that, that said, you know, that's going to be way too much to do the pitch roof, and so the recommendation is to use a different kind of material that's been utilized in different schools. I believe the last project that was done might have been Garfield um, School, and I forget what building it was, but um, it's that type of material that you lay on top, and so it's flat. Uh, it used to be gravel and hot tar, and that didn't hold too long. So uh, a new type of material will be used to make the building, again, um, you know, safe and and not not leak and have damage that is caused every time it rains. And so, uh, this is why uh, this money is being asked to be put to good use. Also, I'd like to point out some of the places where we had a large uh, balance left over was like in the building note, because at the time that um, y'all approved us to use the monies to pay off the building loan, our budget had already been adopted, so we had extra funds in that. Um, also in legal, um, we do have some pending litigation. There just hasn't been any action on it. So that's why those funds haven't been spent. 
also in the maintenance for our fleet we're still getting used to that this is only the second year we've had that fleet so we're still trying to adjust to how much money we need for that in our 2014 budget based on these past two years we are going to be reducing that line item mr chavito and the reason i'm asking those questions because i want the public to know that uh, the money has been put to good use yes sir and there's no other purpose and thank you for bringing it up yes sir other comments thank you Mr. Dr. Rios has a question. Oh. Ms. Valdez, oh, yes, my understanding of the procedure is that if the board uh, moves on the recommendation of the administration to withhold the funds, that they have the option of coming back next month with an amended request, for example, just for the roof or just for the vehicle? Is that? Uh, yes, I believe that's what I was communicated, Ms. Sheedy. Is that? That's correct, yes. on the wishes of the board uh, but the recommendation is that we withhold uh, the funds as recommended and that we encourage the appraisal district to come back and request repairs for the roof uh, and that we make a recommendation based on that uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll act accordingly that would be better to have a, a trail as well when we do the purpose and that was the only reason that I was being asked question on that so I'll go along with the recommendation made by the uh, fleet any questions I'll go Dr. Rios is saying if if our answer is no to to the return I mean they can come back because the money is going to be used anyway but then they have a trail as to what what was done and how it was done the same thing I mean they'll come back and request and then yes sir and it would just be that our recommendation would be well let's do the roof this year and let's withhold on the vehicle uh, now my understanding uh, was all this the other entities have already taken action is, is that uh, correct there's two entities that I know of that have taken action I know Comstock did and I know the city of Del Rio did and, and what were, were there well, Comstock uh, I spoke to them this morning and they had denied or asked to retain the surplus funds I do not know if they were going to going to come back and uh, suggest that they just submit the roofing I was only told that they did reject for them to retain the surplus funds and, uh, and the city it's my understanding um, did not respond to the resolution as uh, required but they had also recommended that it just be to cover the roofing supplies. I mean the roofing repairs. Sorry. Other questions? <coughs> Ready to hear the recommendation verbatim and vote? <coughs> you read the recommendation of yes, administration, sir. please. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees disapprove the resolution presented by the Valverde Appraisal District to amend the 2013 budget by retaining surplus funds from the 2012 from 2012 in the amount of 95,525 but our district's portion being 44,391 okay we've heard the recommendation is there a motion Mr. Chavita has motioned is there a second Ms. Haynes is second. Okay, all in favor by a show of hands. Okay, with, hold your hands up. One. Yes. I mean, it could be brought back. One, two, three, four, five. All opposed? One opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. And for clarity, like what Mr. Mesa and Mr. Chavita and I, this. This is certainly something that the appraisal district can come back and modify in the form. Our motion and, and action says no at this time, certainly not no to an alternate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that 
puts us back on the regular schedule of the agenda. You take a minute, go back to your... Okay, that brings us to agenda item five, which are information items. Information item 5A, recognition of the Fine Arts Recent Visual Arts Junior Varsity and High School Visual Arts Scholastic Event results. Mr. Juan Nanez presenting. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Rios, Board President, Mr. Garabini, and school board members. This evening, I would like to present the results for our visual arts students who competed at the visual arts scholastic event called VASE competition. Our middle school competed in May and in Sonora, Texas, as well as our high school competed in Bryan, Texas earlier in the year. One of the um, um, some of the criteria that uh, go into this competition uh, the, that the judges look for is originality of concepts, technical expertise, understanding of the Texas central knowledge and skills, text for visual arts, and the interpretation of the student's stated intent. Uh, the ju the jurors evaluate the student's artwork using the following standards, reading one, four through one, superior, excellent, average, and then below average. Uh, this evening, uh, two of our instructors are in attendance. I'd like to thank Mr. Greg Germany and also Mrs. Um, Nicole Bowman. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Bowman to please come forward at this time so she can also uh, take the time to explain a little bit about the success of the Me Memorial Middle School, Simply Memorial Middle School. By the way, teacher of the year in the Fine Arts Program, thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, for the um, middle school, for the sixth grade, uh, this is, of course, our second year uh, with the junior base and uh, wonderful uh, participation with the students. They work hard. They're dedicated. Uh, parent support is excellent. Um, this year we took nine students uh, with us. Um, out of the nine, four received superior rating. Uh, the remaining students received excellent. Um, and of course, we always have one student that is the top, receives the top score, and that was Mr. Donald Schultz uh, for this year. Thank you very much for the information. Along with, the, it, with junior vase consists of sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students at this contest, and our peer, Ms. Heather Clark also had two students. That one of them received the bronze award, Kayla. Duckworth with the acrylic and pencil mixed media and the bronze and silver award went to, uh, to, to awarded to Brianna Palafox. At the middle school, Delrio middle eighth grade under the direction of Mr. Greg Germany, we were very, very successful and I think he has an in something interesting to share with you as well. Board members, Mr. Garabin, Dr. Rios, I uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, brag on my students. Uh, we had an excellent year. This will be our second year at VASE. Uh, they changed the rules on us a little bit. Uh, at conference, I found out that uh, they were going to standardize the judging rules for VASE from junior VASE to high school VASE, so it was standard all the way across the board. Uh, so this year we had, instead of one juror, we had four, and they specialized in each area of their expertise, uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional artwork. Uh, we were very successful, and I, first off, I really want to thank uh, my principal who's here, Ms. Gomez, Mr. Nanez, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Ackerman, who was here at the time. I worked three months to try and get a bus so we could take a special needs students to base. Uh, while I was down there, I talked to a, a juror who was the state head judge for the last five years, and she said that this was the first time that a special needs student had ever entered base. So we're at the forefront of that as far as, as our visual arts program. Uh, 
at the eighth grade, I took 19 students with uh, 32 pieces of artwork that were judged. Out of those uh, 19 students, 15 of them scored bronze medallions, four of them scored silver medallions, which is superior. The young man that's in the center, who is Sal Morales, was a special needs student, won two bronzes and a silver. Uh, we also had uh, uh, Katie Float, who is on the left, who scored a bronze and a silver medallion. We also had two other students, uh, which was uh, Natalie Pasias and Mary Jane Cummings, who also scored uh, bronzes and silver medallions. Uh, we also had uh, students, the other students that scored were Amber Cardenas, uh, Brian Dubinsky, Norma Figueroa, Autumn Gamas, uh, Andrea Garcia, Karina Guajardo, Candy Job, Robert Marin, Elizabeth Montavo, and Estella Salinas. All scored high in the judging. Uh, Junior vase is a little bit different. We do not have a below average score. That, that's after they get to state level. But the scoring is still the same. Superior is from 51 points to 60 points. So the judging change from last year is that scored silver. This year, if they scored a superior, the judges had to go back and rejudge those students. We had 24 bronze bronzes in the artwork out of total out of total of 32 pieces of artwork, which was totally outstanding for these students. They did a tremendous job. Uh, their orals, because they have to go through an oral test first, which is five questions that were asked to, by the judges, and then they go through an art production process where the judge looks at the artwork and sees if the discussion that the student gave was the same as what they had in front of them to look at. And our students showed a tremendous amount of maturity and a tremendous amount of uh, art expertise. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jeremy. At high school, freshmen, there were freshmen, we also compete, competed with and uh, were very successful. The medal, uh, medal winners were uh, Jacob Clark, Rosalinda Bermea, Crystal Aguillon, Clarice Ponce, Sandra Correa, Ashley Garza, and Lucero Trevino. As well, we had some several students from the W High School that also won several medals. Samuel Sandoval, Sebastian Ramon, and Jose Garza, and Caitlin Smith. Those instructors, Mr. Chris uh, Escobar. As you can tell, our students did very well this year as the visual arts program continues to grow. One of our future goals is to give the elementary students an opportunity to compete in the elementary division, which is called TEAMS. We look forward to starting this step in our visual arts program. And once again, we'd like to congratulate all the students for their outstanding accomplishment. Uh, VASE is similar. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Next year, sorry. would you be able to maybe coordinate um, an art fair of sorts so that the public could truly enjoy the art that the students put together? I know that we get to see. Of the awards during perhaps an awards ceremony at the same time. Um, those are. I think uh, those children, you know. This is beautiful work. We have pictures of some of their artwork, and it would be really nice to share that with the public. Yes, those are in the plans already for the future, as well as having a, an art. Um, when we meet together at Fine Arts at the beginning of school year, there's some uh, uh, projects that we'd like to work with and hopefully even have some uh, art, um, an art uh, gallery mm -hmm. uh, displayed, uh, and as well as they can also uh, maybe even purchase some of the students' work. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Thank you. Okay, that brings us to agenda item 5B, parental notification of surplus library book distribution. Ms. Paula Johnson presenting. Good evening. 
Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, and board members. Back on April the 15th, as a board, you approved that we classify the old Eastside Library books as surplus. So for the past six weeks to two months, the three fixed asset clerks, Cynthia Vasquez, Veronica Ramirez, and Cynthia Turner, have worked along with three student helpers to prepare and get all of these library books ready for a distribution to parents free of charge to all parents and students of the Del Rio School District. Um, I have some pictures, and I did make pictures for all of you if you'd like them. Uh, Laura will pass them out, but I also have a presentation. the first page of pictures I wanted you to see to give you some idea of what the fixed asset clerks faced when they walked in to the room at the old North Heights campus. Uh, the room, this is just two pictures, that room was loaded with boxes. And they, you can imagine what they had to do. If you'll turn to the next page, you can start seeing how the books look now and how they'll be presented to parents and students when they come to uh, receive these, these books. Um, there were 7,056 books, 260 uh, videotapes that they had to go through, and each book had to be marked Every place that library book was stamped with old East or with Eastside Elementary School Library, that had to be blacked out. Each book had to be stamped with discard. And then throughout the pages of each book, there's indiscriminate on different pages, the school library is stamped there. So each book had to be took time to go through each book and take care of that so when these are given out to the students there's nothing on them that indicates that they are property of this old Eastside Elementary School Library. The books um, are going to be available to, to students and parents uh, beginning the uh, next Monday, the 24th through the 28th. And they'll be open, it will be open from 11 o'clock until 2 o'clock, and from 4 o'clock until 6 o'clock. So parents that work or students that have, are unable to get there at other times can come with their parents during those hours. Um, if there are not any questions, we're just really excited about this. We plan to have this advertised in the Del Rio News Herald. It's going to be on the district web page and the district Facebook page. It will be on our district website. And Mr. Overfelt suggested that it be placed on uh, the radio station 1490. And so I will contact the radio station tomorrow and try to make arrangements to get advertisements for that. The last page is a copy of the memo that will be placed in the paper and it's going to be on our web and on the, you know, in all of the different venues that I gave you. And it's a memo that, that I wrote to the parents just letting them know, yes, sir. Will that be in Spanish as well or just? In the paper, no. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I did not do that. If sure you think it that. should be, well, I can get someone to. Could, could you get in touch with the. Uh, Yes, that's what Mr. Overfelt asked me to one? do. Yes, uh -huh. I'm going to do that first thing in the morning. You think it was on the radio? You want me to try to have somebody do it in Spanish? No, it was just Spanish? a thought. I mean, just, just curious, that's all. Okay, but it, it will be on all the venues that I mentioned. It'll be on the uh, Channel 39, the District Web, the Del Rio News Herald, Facebook, and the uh, Radio station 1490.
he definitely. I mean, he's <coughs> been reached out in what's Spanish. He, what's the other member of the other? We're really excited about this. I think that if the people, that the community, the parents, and the children will avail themselves. Yes, sir. What happens to the books after this is over, right? Because Windows, June 28th. What happens to any books that are Well, written? the books were originally offered to all district librarians. They came and they went through all of the books and they selected everything that they wanted. Everything that they did not want is what you see here. Um, most of the, I will tell you that most of the reference books are com way outdated. Um, I just don't know what all is going to be selected. But the books that are left over, we are just determining that they are that, that they are of no value. And, you know, we will try to offer them to, uh, you know, school in Acuna. Um, or even, like, are there other community agencies, like the Child Welfare Board and just things I've seen out there? Part of the problem, and Ms. Valdez can address this probably far better than I, but part of the problem when you donate like that, when you have expended school district funds, then you get into the problem of how you prove that you're getting a fair market value. But Ms. Valdez can well, we would have explain to create it better an, than I. We would have to create an interlocal with those agencies. Yeah, but. it's very, it's real involved. <coughs> just curious. So we'll just well, let's hope that everything is picked up. Let's we'll just hope everything is picked up. up. We're hoping everything's picked up. If there's still a lot of books remaining, we can still extend for another week. I mean, we're... So, if someone shows up from one of those agencies and just says they want to take the books? We have, there's well, we don't have proof that they're they're not a parent of a student. I mean, you're not asking for any ID or no, no, student no, number. No, we're the only no. district and that serves the students of this district. Yeah. So. And we we're felt not. if we tried to do that, that it would be off-putting that yeah. nobody would, you well, know, want to do it. Yeah. So. Right, and, and and if we're hoping, you know, that they're all picked up, but if there's still plenty of books available, then we will uh, communicate that to the board and with options of re-advertising. Mr. Overfill. You s said, Ms. Johnson, about being outdated and stuff there. I'm looking at the picture here, and by quick count, there's a hundred and something... <laughs> Yes. Um, thesauruses uh, sitting there. Um, and then... I tell you, and they then some, some, I know. And, and then some, some dictionaries that... And I know there are some former English teachers in the room right now um, that used to teach and are now in other positions within the district. And they can attest to this. Um, they were always having to fight for thesauruses and dictionary sets from the, the libraries. We all so the librarians of, of SFD the are librarians. turned this down. Yes. In this neat order, not in yes. the first picture. Yes. I mean, no. this, if you showed me oh, what but, you but want they, here, when, I'd when the, the, the books were originally, uh, they were originally at the old cosmetology building. When they were moved from east side, they were moved to the old cosmetology and they were not all in the piled up boxes like I'm showing you in that first picture. And the librarians were all offered the books. They came, they made selections, they filled up boxes. Um, everything that was left was then boxed up and taken to North Heights so the fixed asset clerks could start working and getting them prepared for, for the sale. Um, I know that the Saurus is not outdated. When I was talking about the reference book, there's some encyclopedias that are not even complete sets oh, that, yeah. you know, that are there that are outdated, that type oh, that, of thing. That I was I can, surprised about the thesaurus and the I dictionaries. I understand, but the, the, and I know it's not your fault at all. Okay. I'm just expressing, wow, um, there, that they wouldn't. So I, I would hope that no one complains they don't have enough materials. Dr. Rios. Campuses. Sorry, Dr. Rios has something. Just, just to add, uh, the, a lot of the dictionaries and thesauruses, because of the testing requirements uh, and them using pictures and that sort of stuff, the, the campuses have had to avail themselves of what is appropriate for the testing. These clearly aren't. Uh, so that's why the schools have since obtained enough uh, 
to be in compliance with, with the requirements. Um, I'm sure that these are of some value to somebody, uh, but unfortunately they don't fit the requirements at this point. Well, I, I can understand the testing part, but just to use in the classrooms, just for everyday use and stuff, but okay. okay. Ms. Ms. Bozano? Yes, ma'am. It's been a while since my kid came home with the really specific supplies and things needed for school. But at one point, they did come home with dictionary and thesaurus. So those lists are not going home so that our students have to buy these to bring them to class, correct? I, I, I have no idea. idea. Do you know, Dr. Hill? Well, I would, hope, I would hope that that wouldn't be because why would we expect you know, parents to purchase something that perhaps they couldn't. No, dictionaries. Well, we have them right here getting ready to be tossed in the incinerator. No, of course not. Uh, I go with uh, Dr. Rios, the same thing. Dictionaries and th uh, thesaurus have been bought, and they're in, the they're in the classroom. There are sets there. They're available all the time for the students. So that is not something that we're asking students to buy. Other questions? Thank you, Dr. We, Rios. We, we thank you uh -huh. for everything. And great work to the ladies yeah. who organized that. Yeah. Are you for hire? <laughs> Agenda item 5C, School Health Advisory Council update. Presenter is Diane Hernandez. Good evening, Mr. Garabedian, members of the board, Dr. Rios. I'm here to give you well, one of two presentations. The first one is on a School Health Advisory Council update, otherwise known as SHAC. All right? In your packet or on what was sent to you, you should have a nifty little uh, kind of synopsis of what exactly SHACs do. And so I'll, I won't go through this. I'll let you read through this at your leisure. Or if you're trying to go to sleep at night, you can thumb through this and it will serve the same purpose. Um, so I'll make it pretty quick and just give you some information. All right. Every independent school district is required by law to have a shack, all right, School Health Advisory Council, of which the majority of members must be parents, meaning 51% of the committee must be parents with students in that particular district, all right, um, but who are not employed by the school district. So that leaves many of us out. But... Um, a shack is a group of individuals representing various segments of the community, generally appointed by the school district to serve at the district level to provide advice to the district on coordinated school health. The shack will assist the district in ensuring that local community values are reflected in the district's health education. Remember, every shack is different. Depends on every shack is different from city to city, from state to state, etc. It just depends on where you are because it's made up of hopefully representing what the community believes in and stands for and what they want to see uh, emphasized in their schools. Now, um, shacks must meet a minimum of four times per year, and they focus on eight different elements, right? Health education, human health services, nutrition services, physical education, healthy and safe school environment, parent community involvement, staff wellness promotion, counseling, and services. Um, are all focused on by this advisory group. Now, that's what it, exactly what it is. It meets a minimum of four times per year and decides what areas they want to focus on. TEA recommended that the, for a town or district of this size that you had anywhere between 15 to 20 members. Okay, that's about option. You can have more. It's difficult if you start getting less. All right, so anywhere between 15 or 20 or more. All right, meet minimum of four. To start recruiting. What we had done before was we had combined the shack with the district PDM, Planning and Decision Making Committee. But after looking at it more intensively and looking at requirements, and it, it, it's a necessity to break this out from the district PDM and have its own separate entity to, to operate as an advisory committee to the board. So um, that's why we are at this point 
going to be placing some sort of notification on the district website and trying to get out any information that we can. Uh, the most, you know, sometimes it depends. Remember, shacks are all different, and different ways of appointing takes place as well. Sometimes the board appoints shack members, which can be a little dicey. Sometimes the uh, it's recruited and volunteers, and then that list is gleaned, and then the board votes on who they would like to sit on the shack committee. So we're going to be placing a notification on the website asking for folks to come forward from the community. That could be anyone as far as parents of students, could be board members if you're so inclined, uh, have that interest, could be uh, doctors, dentists, um, nurses. We want coaches. We want people from all different backgrounds to be able to sit you know, with their areas of knowledge to be able to, uh, to advise y'all because that's exactly what they are. Um, so we will be placing it out on the website as soon as possible to hopefully have this wrapped up by August so we can start with the first meeting near the end of September, optimally, for the first shack. Any questions? Just save them for later. Agenda item 5D, disposal of obsolete electronic and other computer-related equipment. Mr. Casillas presenting. Good evening, Mr. Garbidi, Dr. Rios, and uh, distinguished members of the board. We uh, placed this item for information purposes uh, to let you know of a process that we are starting for uh, this coming year to dispose of several hundred pieces of uh, computer equipment and other things that we've had. Typically, we had been donating to the um, Texas Department of Criminal Justice and, or Department of Corrections, and we would have to take the hard drives out and then trash those. And, and uh, so what we uh, were looking at is what some of the surrounding districts are doing. <clears throat> so um, we spend a lot of man hours on uh, counting the equipment, uh, putting it on pallets, shrink wrapping it, and then to, to give it away. So I looked around at what other districts are doing, and one uh, there's quite a few that have gone to an RFP where companies that recycle some of this equipment, and so uh, we, we're putting together a, um, a, an RFP uh, to get this done. And basically, we're going to get some money out of it because they will pay us for some of the equipment that they do sell. But more importantly, we're saving a lot of man hours in what we have to do in, in counting the equipment, putting it on pallets, shrink wrapping, and then shipping it out. So it has a, a lot of uh, multi-purpose uh, advantages to what we want to do. So just to inform you, this is what's coming up. And in, in case you had any questions. Mr. Chavita. When is this going to be done? Pardon? When are you going to be doing this? For July? It opens it, July 20th. Yes. When you say pellets, do we have that much equipment? Oh, yes. Yes. Hundreds so he has of never pieces been done of this before. No. So this is a new thing, and you're going to be doing at least getting the numbers and the different stuff. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We have it at the warehouse. We have it in the storage rooms. Uh, we have it all over the place. And since we're um, in the we process of, anyway. yeah, oh, yeah, we're going to need more space. So. You know, I think it's a worth, worthy uh, way of disposing the equipment. Anything else? So we'll be coming to you next month. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 5E, presentation of Dr. Fermin Calderon Elementary Campus Snapshot. Dr. Jorge Garza and Brianna Moraida present. Mr. Garbidium, Dr. Rios, members of the board. We come to you with some information on uh, certain schools that we have uh, in Per Se, Calderon Elementary, and North Heights. Just to brief you a little bit of uh, this snapshot, uh, the campuses that chose these snapshots are the campuses that were in Stage 1 AYP, and they took it upon themselves to connect with Region 15 to make sure that uh, they would do a certain item and, well, certain items that they were available. They chose the snapshot. 
we've gone through this before with the district, and we've uh, also done it with uh, the Rio Middle School. These schools, um, for lack of better words, they took a risk to make sure that other entities, another entity would come out and tell us what's going on at that campus with our practices. And of course, looking at those practices so that we can improve the systemic issues that are there. So at this time, I would like to have our first principal, Calderon Elementary, Mrs. Muraya. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we did have the wonderful opportunity of having Region 15 come in and uh, provide us with a snapshot early in December. Um, what that entailed was, um, in, a, in addition to surveys, online surveys that the teachers, parents, and students um, took, they had small focus groups of teachers, parents, and students that spoke with these outside individuals regarding our campus. Um, it, it was one of the things that I do want to share is that by the time we did receive the report back, uh, a few of the items that was listed in the report, we had already started working and addressing those strengths and those weaknesses. A few of the findings, and, and I do know it, it is a big report, so we just kind of condensed it to the main um, focus. Uh, we needed to improve our mission statement. We also wanted to establish a culture of high expectations, um, increase authentic engagement in classrooms, improve procedures to increase respect for self and others, and reduce bullying. And they also found that continuing establishing relationships with parents was also a key goal. Recommendations from Region 15, um, a lot of training professional development, one, um, in mission development for our campus, professional learning communities, data-driven instruction, learner engagement, building positive relationships with parents and community, and of course the revision of our campus-wide procedures for monitoring our students. And our plan of action um, that we did already begin for the next school year. Uh, we did have our formative assessment specifically at targeting strategic questioning to address the higher order thinking and question techniques in a classroom. Uh, we did um, already undergo <coughs> that training. We also submitted uh, for the uh, continued instructional coaching. Staff development plan for our, uh, our, our staff was already submitted to our CNI to address the engagement, the highly engaged classrooms. Uh, teachers have also been trained in the development of the mission statement and established uh, or still establishing the new mission vision for our campus. Uh, we have a new leadership program which is titled Leader in Me for staff and students to be initiated to address the anti-bullying and respect for others component. And uh, we're going to be providing more hands-on training as picnic in the park activity to continue to build our parent relationships. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Questions for Ms. Morena? Yes, I know you received the training on end of May. Um, Delroy Middle School invited key personnel from each campus. So we were taking in our leadership team. We have already uh, met as a campus in our leadership team. We already have some drafts to work on and then we'll finalize that in the summer to start the new school year. Okay. So you're working on the new oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma um, one thing that caught my attention, you know, was when we got the preliminary scores um, and the expectations, I guess, I, I know that there's a lot of new staff yes. that, that you have and uh, the mindset is, has got to be where, you know, expectations need to be way at the very highest way yes, sir. Um, because it's something that as board members you know it caught our attention mm -hmm. it caught my attention right away of course that um, the scores are not what they need to be right and so academically something needs to happen to make sure that uh, those scores are brought up you are right yes sir um, in the areas not only that are tested mm -hmm. but in all subject areas right and through the surveys the data shows that the high expectations are shared, yet the evidence in the classroom has yet to meet that. So yes, we are planning to work on that. Um, it's already in our campus improvement plan for the next school year. So we will be addressing that, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Chavito? Yes, sir. Ms. Mesa pointed out, and, and I've always talked 
divided among some members here. There's a lot of change of staff, a lot of new. Every year we start a new. We need to start working on, on keeping our teachers in some way or another. Retaining. Some. Maybe find some way. I'm not sure. Our, uh, superintendent will be looking into it because we, there's a tremendous <coughs> change of staff members. And, uh, oh, yes, sir. And if we can improve on that, I think our schools will improve. Because we're finding out, you know, just like you think, we dress up really nice. Sometimes we forget to put that gas on it in the automobile that move. Mm -hmm. So maybe not just finding out what it's what is causing this problem, but having the personnel to be able to do it. Yes, sir. You're right. And, 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 and it's hard. Mm -hmm. And it's hard on the principal because every year you start a new. Yes, sir. Finding out see what they can do, where they are, and try to get them to where they're supposed to be. It's hard. Yes, sir. Trying to do see yes, sir. We can do the real part. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. That brings us to F, presentation of North Heights Elementary Campus Snapshot. Again, Ms. Dr. Garza and Maite Solis. Okay, at this time, we will have Mrs. Solis come up here and present. She will be uh, presenting the snapshot. She has been at this campus as an interim principal for, this is her fourth week, start of the fourth week. So she, I am confident that she has read this snapshot and she will do a great, great presentation. Good evening, Mr. Garavedian, uh, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. Um, just like Brianna stated, um, our reports are very, very similar. It was the uh, campus snapshot presented by Region 15. Um, ours was actually conducted in February, and so these are the findings based on um, that snapshot. Um, there were actually nine principals of high um, performing schools that were um, evaluated, and at North Heights, there were two that were specifically um, addressed in their findings. Um, safe and orderly environment was one of them, and then the um, PLCs. And so under safe and orderly environments, the need for an evaluation of campus-wide safety procedures and routines that contribute to student success was one of the findings that they said um, we needed to ensure that we focused on. The development and implementation of And under our professional learning communities, we had um, unify the campus community, including leadership staff, students, and parents for the good of the students. And so some of their recommendations were um, conduct a school safety and security audit, and this should be done by um, an external person or group. Um, they did make note that um, for us to check that this was something that was up to date, if it was not up to date, that we make sure that this was something that we focus on at the beginning of the year. Um, they also made note that we should evaluate all procedures, including discipline, safety, daily routines, that include visibility of campus leadership. And so um, in regards to that, there was a mention of the pickup and drop off areas um, at our campus. Um, that has been a concern and, and that was something that they did note that needed to be addressed. And then they also made um, the recommendation that uh, we look at the safety of um, our building in regards to emergencies. And so that was something that was addressed as well. Um, they suggested a safety, a safety officer uh, be placed on campus while we begin the implementation of the new procedures and policies um, as another suggestion for that. Um, going to the uh, professional learning communities, um, they did suggest to conduct a campus planning event. Um, and this is very similar to what we're looking at as a district, um, as a, our planning protocol, where we build leadership teams where our district um, spearheads those meetings. We look at what our principal can do, the AP, the leadership teams within the campus. Um, and so I feel like we really are headed in the right direction regarding our PLCs. Uh, serious consideration for leadership coaching with a focus on establishing and supporting campus-wide procedures and improving climate and culture on the campus. Um, quite often, if you look through that report, there is a discussion about the climate and culture of North Heights and making sure that we build on that um, as, as one of the forefronts. 
Um, expectations of principal should be defined and clearly communicated to staff and students. Um, and again, they made note that um, if we can definitely um, ensure that our students are um, being successful instructionally in the classroom, um, then there's no need for us to have to worry about the discipline and the uh, procedures on, on a daily basis because if we can keep track of them with the learning environment, then that will definitely benefit our campus. And then our plan of action is not as specific as Ms. Muraida's for Calderon um, because I am um, in a transition, um, but there are some ideas that we've already begun to um, discuss. Uh, when I came on board, I presented this to the staff um, as our May faculty meeting, and so we did meet as a staff. They offered um, numerous suggestions to what they thought was going to be a plan of action, um, and, and, and that, I think, was the priority, making sure that the teachers understood that it really is um, a part of what they should do, and when we create the mission and when we create a vision, uh, they definitely need to be a part of that discussion. And so some of the ideas for our plan of action is, of course, to develop well-thought-out procedures um, that includes discipline, it includes safety, it includes the daily routines, how kids enter and exit the building, what goes on in common areas such as the cafeteria, the playground, recess time, um, in the classroom, in the hallways. I mean, we really need to just ensure that as a leadership team, we're focusing on developing those things um, and making sure that everybody on campus understands the importance of it and, and just selling that vision to everyone so that we all have um, a common theme. We also um, are hoping that there is a focused training through the means of the curriculum and instruction department, um, the discussion of instructional coaches, uh, what that person would be playing as a role on that campus to build the capacity of the entire team in the implementation of the planning protocol. Um, and again, this was something that was suggested by Region 15, but I think that our district is definitely headed in the right direction in regards to that. Um, and then finally, monitor and assess instruction and procedures with fidelity. Um, and again, that's just something that I think that we need to do um, as a whole. We need to make sure that not only are we um, bringing in these uh, procedures and, and developing them as a leadership team, but that there is fidelity when we decide that we need to monitor them um, and, and make sure that we're monitoring and not forgetting that instruction is you know, the forefront of what we do. Any questions? Discussion? Questions? Mr. Toledo? Well, like I said uh, last year with when Mr. Costa first came on board, uh, at least we had a game plan. Now we. Now we've been proven the game plan and we're going to be able to do. We know what we need to do. But I think one of the biggest things, and I know being a principal a long time ago and things have changed, it's hard to be a principal now. Because there's so many things to do. But we need to find some way, like it says up here, for the principals to be visible at all times. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we get bucked down with a lot of uh, a lot of papers that need to be turned in. And, and But I think the, our teachers, our kids need to to uh, see the, the principals on, on top of things. Yeah, I know, again, I repeat, it's hard. But I think we need to start working on it. Because we're going to do everything possible able to provide for every student. Thank you, Mr. Mesa. Um, Ms. Solis, on the safety audit, uh, was the Region 15 personnel involved with doing conducting a safety audit? No. 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 I am not 100% sure of that. Uh, Ms. Salinas is not here right now. I do not think so, sir, but I can find out. I don't want to say something that's not accurate. Okay, I guess uh, they do conduct safety audits in this different right. districts. I, I just, just don't know if that was done. I know that that was one of the concerns. The staff was uh, concerned with some of that stuff, so they did share that with the snapshot uh, team. Okay. Okay. Ms. Solis, you have that um, the safety audit under the rec a recommendation made by them. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yes, that was a recommendation of theirs. Else? So the, the, this is something that gets revisited. I know you said parts of it and what you what you'd be acting on was presented to the to the campus. So it's it'll come back early right. fall, right? I know you keep revisions. Yes, sir. Okay. 
course. We'll be working on the findings of this uh, for all campuses, the four campuses that have this. We will be working with uh, closely with the principals to make sure that some of these things are implemented, if not all. Especially when you have a bunch of stuff that we need to look at. And we just like you with, I just came in this room, spent about four o'clock this morning, and came in this afternoon, and I lived two or three apartments. But anyway, and I know I'm asking for something that this guy said it's, it's hard, but I think you can make it simpler for us as to maybe line graph so we can see where we were last year and where right. we at this year. And then when we look at it, we don't have to go through all this. So if you can possibly do that for us, I think I would appreciate it. Other districts are doing it, and I'm bringing it up because I saw them. I mean, they go up there and they look at it, and, and automatically you can see, hey, we're taking a dive or we're doing great because of the line graph. Of course. Dr. Rios, two things. One, uh, based on the snapshots that uh, each of the campuses underwent as part of their improvement process, we will make sure that the items that were specified are get included in strategies for the campus improvement plan so that we can follow up on them and, and they're not forgotten. And then in terms of uh, line graphs, uh, which was just brought up, we do have a report uh, that I mentioned in the previous board update that I sent on Friday so that it can't be visible. And uh, I asked for direction, uh, see if y'all wanted it, how you wanted me to present to you. So that, that's already in the works. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Agenda item 5G, attendance rates to date by school. Mr. Luna presenting. Good evening, honorable board members, Mr. Superintendent, community stakeholders. My name is Rene Luna. I'm the MIS director. And tonight, I'm on your agenda, to present ADA and enrollment data. Slide number one has changed just a little bit. It was recommended that we add enrollment data to the ADA chart that we present monthly. So we have done that and we've gone back historically for this year, 2012, 2013, and added that um, line with enrollment data. As you can see, we have the data for May 2013. However, the month of June 2013 only had five days for enrollment. So when we did the ranking, we used the month of May, which was a complete month, and just left June off of, uh, off of the rankings. For the enrollment, I'm sorry, for the ADA for the month of May 2013, Lamar, was in uh, first place, 97.52, Garfield, 97.16, Buena Vista, 97.15, Chavita, 97.11, Dr. Lonnie Green Elementary, 97.02, Dr. Fermin Calderon, 96.79, North Heights Elementary, 96.78, and Irene Cardwell, 93.9. For secondary campuses, Del Rio Middle School, 96.44, San Felipe Memorial Middle School, 95.96, Del Rio Freshman School, 95.75, and Del Rio High School, 94.26 for the month of May. It was Friday. We went ahead and included the data to close out the year. So we do have year-to-date rankings. Coming in first place in elementaries for the year 2012-2013, Lamar Elementary, 97.97 for the year. Ruben Chavira Elementary, 97.51. Buena Vista Elementary, 97.43. Garfield Elementary, 97.42. Dr. Yolani Green, Jr. Elementary, 97.37. Dr. Fermin Calderon, 97.26. North Heights Elementary, 97.04. And Irene Cardwell, 94.87. Secondary campuses, ranking 96.84, San Felipe Memorial Middle School, 96.77, 
Delray Freshman School, 96.2, and Delray High School, 95.28. chance have a chance to follow up on the question I had a month ago about when the last time the district had not reached 96 percent attendance no sorry I did not uh, research that but I, I will have time to do that thanks anything else okay next item is 5h discipline report to date by school various campus principals presenting <coughs> Last board meeting, we got some clear direction from the board to be able to present the data in a way that uh, told a more complete story. Uh, we went back, and uh, Mr. Casillas and uh, his staff uh, looked at it. Unfortunately, the way the reports are written, it, it requires a lot more hand counting. Uh, so, time-wise, we weren't able to provide that. But there was a commitment from our staff to be able to see what we can do program-wise to be able to desegregate the data. For example, uh, San Felipe Memorial had a large number of incidents uh, of misbehavior, but it's difficult to be able to say uh, out of 40-something cases, how many are repeat offenders? Specifically of these repeat offenders, how many got ISS versus suspension because it, it was uh, a second time that they had offended? So we understand what the board wanted. There's no mistake on that. It's just in terms of being able to have a system in place to produce those reports without having to count every referral by hand. We're not there yet, but we're committed to researching that over the summer. So what you're going to see today is no different than what you saw uh, uh, last month. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Garavidian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. Uh, my name is Jose Perez, and I will be presenting for the elementary campuses. For the month of May, Garfield Elementary is reporting nine incidents of Code 21, Code of Conduct violation. It is reporting five different types of action, from out-of-school suspension to lunch detention, corrective counseling, detention, and parent conferences. Buena Vista Elementary is reporting three violations of the Student Code of Conduct and two different types of actions, out-of-school suspension and parent conferences. Dr. Fermin Calderon Elementary is reporting three violations of the Student Code of Conduct and three types of actions taken, including out-of-school suspension, in-school suspension, and parent conferences. Dr. Lonnie Green Elementary is reporting two different types of offenses, 28 violations of the Student Code of Conduct, one case of insubordination. Uh, they're reporting various actions that it, they have taken for the month of May, from out-of-school suspension to in-school suspension, detention, and uh, privileges removed for computer use. North Heights Elementary is reporting two types of offenses, one weapon incident and 28 code of conduct incidents. It is reporting four different types of actions taken, out of school suspension, in school suspension, detention, and corrective counseling. 
Memorial Elementary is reporting five cases of violation of the Student Code of Conduct with four different types of actions, out of school suspension, in school suspension, parent conferences, and corrective counseling. Chavira Elementary is reporting four different types of offenses, 15 student code of conduct, one incident of tobacco, one incident of insubordination, and two incidents of fighting, or rather maybe two students, one incident. And the actions taken include out of school suspension, parent conferences, corrective counseling, removal of computer use, privileges, and lunch detention. All in all, for the elementary campuses, we have 2% of all of the elementary students who received some type of incident referral, 98% of the students did not. Any questions or comments? Mr. Overfeld? <clears throat> the weapon at North Heights. What, um, what are we looking at? Screwdriver or what, what classified out as a weapon? Um, it was actually an incident that happened in early May. Um, I did ask um, my interim assistant principal to kind of update me on that. Um, it was um, a knife, and it was um, a very small one that was found just by coincidence um, as the student was opening through the backpack. Happened to have it on, um, didn't realize it was in the backpack, and so there was um, actions taken in regards to that. Um, I believe it was an out-of-school suspension plus some in-school suspension as well, along with a parent conference. Anything else? Anything else? Mr. Garabinian, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. We're here to present the uh, San Felipe Memorial Middle School May Offense Report. I believe it's in your packet. Uh, we did have uh, 15 uh, student code of conduct violations, 70 insubordinations, and uh, two students that were in a fight, involved in the fight. For the uh, action report that was taken, we had seven incidences with out of school, uh, out of school suspension, one in school suspension, four students placed in AEP, 18 detentions, excuse me, 17 detentions, 10 parent conferences, and let me clarify that uh, Ms. Adams makes contact with about 95% of the parents on every incident. Uh, we have 10 corrective uh, counseling, two part day out of school suspensions, one part day in school suspension, 13 remedial uh, removal of access uh, privileges, and that's a bus, and 11 uh, after-school detentions, 10 lunch detentions. And uh, Ms. Adams went and broke it down how you guys want it for next time. We do have 41 repeaters in this bunch. 41? 41, yeah. Are there any questions? Mr. Garabini and Dr. Rios and members of the board. I will be presenting for Delro Middle School. This is for the month of May. Our offenses were, we had 18 code of conduct violations, 124 insubordinations, 12 students involved in fighting, that was seven fights, and serious misbehavior, we had two students. Our 
our disciplinary actions include an expulsion. We had 32 out-of-school suspensions. We had in, one in-school suspension, five students that were placed at alternative, 63 detentions, one parent conference, and 61 corrective counseling. Are there any questions on any of that? Mr. Chavita has a question yes. for the expulsion. Was it that was actually something that happened at SGLC. The student was already placed there from Delroy Middle School, and it was an incident where she actually grabbed a teacher. Good evening, Mr. Garibedian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. Uh, we're here to present the freshman discipline report. As you can see, we had one code of conduct. We had uh, four con controlled substance, 24 conduct code, and 47 insubordination. And the uh, actions for those were as follow. We had a total of eight out-of-school suspension, another eight in-school suspension, three that were placed at the SGLC, 45 detention, one, uh, the item was confiscated, I'm sorry, one parent conference. And like Mr. Ramos says, we contact all the parents, but when you only give one action for parent conference, it only logs in as parent conference. So that was the only action that was taken on that case. 13 corrective counseling, three uh, partial day OSS, and three um, telephones uh, taken away from the students. Is there any questions? No discussion? Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Garabini and Dr. Rios, school board members. I'm here for high school. Um, we had tw uh, our code of conduct, 21 uh, offenses. Uh, we had five students. And we had one um, case of uh, sexual assault that happened outside of school. We had 89 students that were insubordinate. Uh, we had two students that were involved in a fight. And then we had two students that were uh, serious misbehavior. I wasn't going to say that. And then the actions that we had for those incidents, um, we had five out-of-school suspensions, two in-school suspensions, um, two were placed at STLC, uh, 70 had detention, two had parent conferences, and again, just like the other campuses have stated, we have several parent conferences, and then also 23 with corrective counseling. And then we just have a pie chart to show um, that we have 98% Also to show that some of our students were um, had double incidents or uh, had duplicate uh, referrals. We had a higher number, and then the number goes lower because a lot of them had two incidents or three incidents with the referrals. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. That was at SGLC. They got in trouble over there at SGLC. They're kids that were already assigned over there, but they are our students, and they had an incident occur at SGLC. What kind of misbehavior falls under the serious misbehavior? That it's not fights, that it's not weapons, that it's not drugs? I would say... 
Oh. On, on both of the students, they were two separate students, and it was just persistent misbehavior there. And with, you know, an, another fight and other activities that had happened, that there had been a lot of um, documentation on both of the students. Yes, persistent. Thank you. I think there's a question from Ms. Girl. Um, maybe just for clarification, because maybe it's been answered uh, before. Um, those students that go to the SGLC, uh, they're still coded as students at the high school, students at, at this and that there. Is there a way that the <coughs> report can just show just things that happen at SGLC? Or do we want to keep it like this year, like this you know, more than serious or whatever the, the name of it was. Is there a way to see just what's happened in SGLC or does it have to always be coded within the, the schools themselves? As part of the process that we're doing to improve the, the reporting, and we can include this. Um, so uh, Mr. Casillas, I know he's in the booth back there. We'll make a note of that and, and do our best to separate it. I'm sure we can. Okay. It's just a little, little I'm just, just wondering because I know sure. it, it tends to run up figures when they're presenting uh, there, just to show a separate picture, right? Right. right. Mr. Mesa. Yeah, that's pretty much a concern that I think we've expressed at several meetings that it goes back to the campus and the campus takes the blame, but mm -hmm. it's really you know happened off campus and so something needs to happen there and I think. Um, if we separate it, I think we'll see how much of that is happening and not to blame, you know, the, the, the um, home campus. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Chavita? Yeah. I think we need to be a little tougher with those guys. You know, they're, they're there because they're causing problems. And if they continue to cause problems, why do we want to keep them? And I know they're deserving of education and everything, but they're causing other people to learn. So I think uh, we need to find some way to, some of them are even there because they're ordered to be there. And uh, I don't know why, I haven't seen it, I haven't been there, but I don't know. It's kind of a situation that, that we need to do something about it. Because they go out there feeling like they can do just about anything. And they continue to do the same thing. Like I was saying that uh, last time that I mentioned about uh, this one, you know, we, here we are all the time trying to work, see what we can do for them. And, and we need to really turn the water on them and, and see, you know, hey, listen, you're either going to be here and, uh, hey, or you're going to have to find a place somewhere else. Because the reason for that is because, the reason I'm saying is because there's some good kids that maybe they made a mistake while they were at the school on the campus and they end up out there. And, and, and they're... They learn from the other kids, and, and before we know it, we're going to have a, you know, kind of so. But we need to, you know, we need to work some of it. And, and now that I'm at that, I was going to ask Mr. Gosh after we finish up. We have quite a few people that are out of, uh, out of school suspension. What do we do with those kids, <coughs> especially in May? How do they catch up, uh, you know, with the testing, they said? Do we have some kind of a plan? Oh, suspension, uh, suspended that they are required, the teachers are supposed to work with these students no matter what. When, once they come back, they are uh, allowed to make up any assignments that uh, they miss. But, but do we have a, a is that, you know, you will remember that the, the teacher needs to be told and directed right. because sometimes I hear, oh, he couldn't, they wouldn't, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That has to be done. So right. it's, it's yes. Done. Mr. Chavita, on that token, what you just said, like in the month of May, we had four out-of-school suspensions, and we were very conscientious because we were testing EOC. So a lot that they had to review in there. Um, we made special accommodations also for tutorials as well. You know, they we still needed them to attend, even though they had had that incident. But a lot of those kids were not out-of-school suspended because we needed to maximize the time of their review and, and so forth for their test. That's great. You know, as long as we have something that we can be doing with it. That way, uh, the parent comes up here and tries to blame.
they must. Right. They're not passing the exhibit. Hey, you got a packet for them, like she was saying. You have a system to take care of those kids from the elementary all the way to high school. Yes, sir. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item. of the 2004 bond construction program. Presenter, Dr. Carlos Rios. I think, uh, Dr. Carlos, it was the other presentation. There's two of them. Mr. Garabini, members of the board, the intention of this item is just to provide an update as to where we are with the 2004 bond construction project. And this presentation is in anticipation to an action item that we'll be presenting later on tonight. In 2004, the voters approved a $34.2 million um, bond for the district. It was related to the construction facilities allotment. The, the projects were approved by the board, and they include the following. To read, um, Dr. Arza, I'm going to ask you to read it because I, it's not visible from here. Uh, new Garfield Elementary, new facility for 800 students, PE gym, on site parking, and landscape. Lamar Elementary, 16 new classrooms, new, administ new administration guidance and clinic, uh, renovate cafeteria kitchen, and a PE gym. Eastside Elementary, now Cardwell, 10 new classrooms, two new group restrooms. Convert existing K-1 classrooms to computer, art, and music labs. Uh, live safety ADA upgrades, PA, uh, PE gym. Ruben Chavita Elementary, 10 new classrooms, two new group restrooms. Uh, new library, live safety ADA upgrades, PE gym. Uh, Marion Russell Elementary, now North Heights, eight new classrooms, new administrative guidance, live safety ADA upgrades, renovate uh, classroom, and gym. San Felipe Memorial, renovate existing main uh, building, renovate an enlarged cafeteria kitchen, life safety. Four new science labs and Buena Vista, a P gym. Sorry. Um, summer of 2006, we received partial funding, uh, 21.9 million, and then in September, uh, Farrell Brown Associates and Graves and Associates were selected as the art to provide architect services. In 2008, we received the remainder amount because it was IFA money. It came in two separate disbursements. And then again, uh, in 2008, Farrell Brown Associates and Graves and Associates were selected as the architectural services uh, for the $12.25 uh, million project. And in 2004, the bond projects uh, are completed or near completion include the following. In summary, in the next slide, all of the bond projects were completed with the exception, obviously, east side because that was repurposed. And the two outstanding projects have to do with uh, Ruben Chavira, which uh, is the 10 classroom expansion. And what's that second bullet there, Dr. Garza? Two new group restrooms. And, and the restrooms, and then uh, Buena Vista, the gym. Now, moving on to the next slide, uh, we'll note that. Buena Vista Elementary would be the project that we're recommending. At the current time, uh, Ruben Chavita, uh, they're not overflowing. They would, I'm sure they'd love to have the new classrooms, but we're recommending Buena Vista because uh, they're the only elementary school that does not have a gym. We believe that uh, the money that's remaining, which is $2.6 million uh, that has been accrued through interest, we do not believe that that's enough money to complete both the 10 classroom expansion and the Buena Vista gym. So as uh, administration, we're prioritizing the Buena Vista gym because it is the only elementary school uh, without uh, a gym. Farrell Brown and Associates are the next architecture group to, to be doing a project. They've been rotating them. Um, so that's who would do the project for us. This is a site of the uh, Buena Vista area. You can see the area that's a little checker checkered. Uh, we have the on the top left-hand corner. Can you point that with with the mouse, Dr. Garza? Right there. Okay, that's one site. 
and then the other side, the one closest to the track. Okay, right now, that side uh, would be the preferred site because that picture is not as large as it, it needs to be. It would encroach on a couple parking spaces, but we won't give up the playground space that we would in that other option. So that would be our recommendation to do the Buena Vista Gym, to use the existing funds that have been accrued through interest, and to probably build it there on, on that site nearest uh, the track. Uh, if there are any questions, we have a representative from uh, Barrel and Associates. Uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions. Future leader? That's great. I like that site. But what I would like to, since the gentleman is here, is that once we get start construction, as you know, as you all of us saw, I mean, some of us were not on the board. The farm was in 204. It took them, that's, that's on call party. We have that money and not be able to construct. Our kids, some of those kids were already in high school. They didn't get the, uh, the, the facility that they should have enjoyed. So regardless who builds that, we better get on and tell them, hey, listen, you're either going to build it within a certain time. Question, because I know that Buena Vista had an issue with drainage, and you know that's resulting in a canal bed being built around it, and so for the runoff. And I just wondered, um, I like the site that is planned, that it wouldn't take away from the other playground, because I use it quite a bit, but um, I worry about the leveling of that area, because again, it's everything behind Buena Vista is a lot higher, and so when it rains, it seems to just come up on school grounds, and I think you know we had the issue. I know Mr. Salinas has tried several things, and I think the latest thing, you know, the it's almost like a moat around all the school. <laughs> I'm sure the drainage will be taken care of before it's done. I visited with the architect, and uh, he's here if he can expand on it. But that was one of the considerations <laughs> as as to where they would put it and, and how they could rechannel uh, the water that's coming up from the hill. Well, with that. Good evening, Dr. Reyes and board. My name is Tom Mustard. I'm a partner with Farrell Brown and Associates. Uh, you've, you've probably met both David and, uh, and Tom. Uh, I have not been up here for several years. I helped with uh, when we did uh, physical surveys back in, I think, 2004. Uh, basically, what, what we're talking about doing here is that the I don't have a pointer, but the, the location that we're showing there, uh, the last word that we've had is, the, is that that building would probably slid a little bit further down the page a little bit because we have so much excavation that would have to happen with the hill. And uh, uh, we have a location that is, uh, if, if slid down a, a, a little bit, uh, we'll only get into that parking lot minimally. And what's really good about that, it, it, it puts the building at a level with the existing school. And so we won't have a lot of, of filling and cutting to make this thing work. And uh, it's real close to what you're seeing right there, but it's just slid down a little bit. I think the, the bottom line is that hill would, 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 the excavation of that hill and the drainage that you're talking about would make that, that site kind of a, a bad location, so we're, we're talking about sliding it just a little bit further down. Also heard a little bit of concern about the timing, and it's my understanding that the, the, uh, the drawings for this building are just uh, almost done. The, the, um, uh, the timing for this project is very quick, and it will, it will happen, and it's, it's, it's in the mill to be done, be done very quickly, and Dr. Reels can fill you in on that. Is there anything else you need on, on the siting? Just the only uh, don't want the board to think that we're jumping the gun on the the design. The design is almost we're not, we're done. We're not. No, we've done these gyms at multiple sites, and in terms of the goal is uh, the reason we're bringing this this month and not next month is because our goal will be to finish the construction uh, before the following school year begins, so that it doesn't have to overlap from one year to the next. And we make that clear to the architects. The goal is to impose on the campus through construction for just one year to make sure we're done uh, during the 2013-2014 school year so that when we start the following school year, we don't have to worry about uh, having any more constructions or, or obstructions to the traffic or anything. And 
that is our goal. We're, we're, we're working, we're working very that. quickly to get all the answers done so we can get in there and get that done. Any other questions? Questions for Dr. Rios? That's the end of the presentation. Well, great. I think it's a good thing. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Brings us to agenda item six, uh, the consent agenda, starting with consent A, which is consideration to approve minutes of the following meetings May 20th, regular school board meeting, May 20th, 2013, regular school board meeting, May 28th, 2013, special call. Workshop. Does any board member wish to pull any items from the consent A agenda for discussion? No? Is there a motion to approve the items on the consent A agenda? Mr. Chavita has motion. Mr. Mesa has second. All in favor, by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. That brings us to consent B agenda. Does any board member wish to pull any items from the consent B agenda for discussion? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, we just received notification for item KK, which is a PO over 25 to Wenger for seating. They've sent an email to Mr. Nanias where there would uh, be an additional 2,500 for installation. So that PO over 25 would change to 92,371. Clarifying that or adding that. Okay, with um, that additional information, any one want to pull something to discuss from consent B? Ms. Lozano? Okay, she has, Ms. Lozano has some questions about that item you just mentioned. And it's for audience seating. Um, it really doesn't have anything to do with seating, but it has to do with comfort in that little theater with um, AC. We're going to have really nice seats, but it's going to be hot or cold. Yes, ma'am. And um, the Cool Schools grants that we received has us installing uh, an additional chiller for the high school. Unfortunately, right now, the high school's been running, uh, cooling that whole central area with only one chiller working appropriately. So it has affected the little theater. It's affected the, the older gym. Uh, now, they will, um, as part of the Cool Schools grant, it will be replaced before the end of uh, July as required by the grant. So that should address uh, the comfort in that area. This is just part of a bigger renovation uh, packet for the little theater. There's also some flooring that will come later, some, some painting uh, uh, and different issues that uh, Mr. Salinas has worked with um, our fine arts uh, coordinator to make sure it's all improved. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the items on, con on the consent B agenda? Chavita has motioned. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Overfelt is second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. <coughs> Before we move on, as is the custom, to uh, read the list of donations, the donors, and to thank them publicly. It's a long list, as everyone can see. Does any, uh, you know, it dawned on me I've been reading this list for 11 months or what. Is, is there another board member who would like to read the list? <laughs> I'll do it, sir. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Overfelt has requested to read the list. All righty. 
um, donation by Pro Color Studio in the amount of $1,345 to Garfield Elementary. Uh, donation by Life Touch in the amount of $1,242.21 to Irene Cardwell. Uh, donation by Life Touch in the amount of $1,119 uh, to Buena Vista Elementary. Pro Color Studio in the amount of $700 to Dr. Lonnie Green. Life Touch in the amount of $339.90 to Delroy High School Journalism Club. Walmart in the amount of $250 to Dr. Lonnie Green Elementary Second Grade Cluster. Uh, Time Warner in the amount of $1,500 to Delroy Middle School Robotics. Time Warner in the amount of $1,500 to Delroy High School Robotics. Life Touch in the amount of $67.50 to Delroy Freshman. Pro Color Studio in the amount of $1,000. 73 to Dr. Lonnie Green. <clears throat> Pro Color Studio in the amount of $578 to North Heights Elementary. Maxi Energy Company in the amount of $500 to North Heights Elementary. The Delroy Housing Authority and Goldbeck Company Panoramic in the amount of $833 to Delroy High School Volunteer Income Tax Assistance or VITA. Uh, um, oh, excuse me. Goldbeck um, Company. Panoramic Photography was in the amount of 243 to the Del Rio High School senior class. City of Del Rio donating $300 to Del Rio Middle School Ballet Folklorio. City of Del Rio donating $300 to Del Rio Middle School Mariachi. The Rams Basketball Booster Club in the amount of $1,000 to Del Rio High School Athletics. Life Touch in the amount of $245.43 to Del Rio Middle. Life Touch in the amount of $265.31 to Delroy Middle. The Ladies Auxiliary of the VFW, $500 to North Heights Elementary. The Spot, $368 to North Heights Elementary. The Delroy Bank and Trust in the amount of $300 to North Heights Elementary. $300 to Garfield Elementary. Um, Pro Color Studio in the amount of $595 to Dr. Fermin Calderon. ASD.com Incorporated. $470 and one penny to Dr. Fermin Calderon Elementary. Uh, Lydia Lyon in the amount of $110.50 to Lamar Elementary. Stripes LLC in the amount of $1,000 to Delroy High School. Pro Color Studio in the amount of $966 to North Heights. Life Touch in the amount of $246.16 to Migrant Program. Uh, and Life Touch in the amount of $76 uh, to the Migrant Program. And a non-monetary donation uh, by the Calderon PTO of benches, basketball goals valued at $1,925 to Dr. Fermin Calderon Elementary. And always, as always, we thank uh, all of uh, those who donated uh, to the different schools and causes. Thank you. Okay, it's now... The reason. The reason. We'll be here a while longer. <laughs> it's it's now 7:40 p.m. and we're on the discussion action items. Discussion action item 8A: consideration to approve the competitive sealed proposals as a construction delivery method for the construction of Buena Vista Elementary gymnasium project. Carlos Rios presenting. Members of the board, uh, board president, we have a presentation, and I really don't know, uh, this being my first time bringing one of these uh, items, I don't know in what detail you want me to get into it. Uh, so we, we created the presentation in anticipation of questions, uh, and I'll, I'll gladly go through it, uh, but it's the board's uh, prerogative to choose the construction method uh, for each project. Uh, we're recommending the competitive seal proposal. So the presentation takes us through the different types of proposals. It takes us through the different types of um, projects that we've done and what type of proposals for building we've used. Um, so suffice it to say, we're recommending the competitive seal proposal for the Buena Vista Gem. Now, if it's the wishes of the board, I can definitely go through the presentation. Um, or you can ask questions about the recommendation. What would you rather I do? I, I just. I would like to know. Why the uh, that method of construction okay. instead of the whole thing? Okay. The, the, the project in itself isn't uh, 
isn't that big. It's one gym. Uh, and the competitive seal proposal allows uh, or facilitates for local uh, builders uh, access to bidding on this process. And uh, I, uh, as I researched, uh, you know, how they had been awarded in the past, when we used this this method, uh, it was clear that it was local builders. Uh, I believe there was about four of them that had benefited from bidding on, on uh, using this method. Uh, that's why uh, the chief operations officer uh, brought this recommendation to me, and I accepted it. It's for one gym. It's not a, a project that's that big in scope, and it would allow uh, local contractors to bid on it. That's a good reason. So that, that's really what we're doing. Um, would the issue of the timeline be a problem to ask here? Or later? Um, once we go through the process and the bid's accepted and we have you know, accepted who the contractor is going to be, um, whoever it is, are we going to hold to what is on paper? Uh, there for, for completion date and, and fines, etc., or withholdings, because I know Mr. Chavita has brought that up in, in the past, particularly out at, at um, Chavita Elementary, uh, with it running over uh, there, and, and it has been explained to us by uh, others uh, there that we don't do it because we don't want to scare off people bidding on stuff, but then we get comfortable, or those individuals get comfortable, I can run over and Nothing bad's going to happen. So, are we going to start holding to that? And I know there's others that express the same wishes. In just to, to be transparent, uh, there have been issues uh, that I've been made aware of, having worked in other districts. It, it, it's not isolated to Del Rio. There, there's been delays in it, and I can very, uh, very comfortably say. I stand ready uh, to take the direction from the board. And if, as a team of eight, you know, we agree to hold the builders accountable, well, that's exactly what I'll do. I'll bring the information to you. I'll, I'll if there are delays, which I hope there are not, if there are delays, I'll tell you there was delays, X amount of delays for, for rain, X amount of delays for you know, steel maybe not being available, or whatever they may be. And I will clearly uh, have a recommendation from the board, uh, and even then, follow the wishes of the board and hold them uh, as accountable as we need to hold them to make sure that our project is complete in a timely manner. But we'll make that decision together. Uh, I will not uh, uh, skew my recommendation in any way, and I'll be 100% entirely transparent. So, yes, if that's the wish of the board, absolutely. You said this is the uh, delivery method that will allow local folks to bid or submit their uh, RFPs, or we're sending out, sending out the RFPs. Is there not a delivery method that will allow anyone to bid, external, internal? Well, the, the uh, particularly with a construction manager at risk, uh, which has been used in numerous projects here, uh, the local contractors uh, don't have the resources to bid out uh, because of different requirements and whether it be in bonds uh, or just different requirements that, that uh, I'm sure our, our architect uh, can fully expand on. But I know that when we do construction manager at risk, uh, they do not bid. Uh, they, they, they can't compete. And again. Are we shortchanging ourselves? We have used uh, the different methods with the exception of the uh, uh, competitive bidding which is just a sealed proposal. And I believe with the design build contract, we haven't done those in the past. But we have done numerous projects with both the construction manager at risk and the competitive sealed proposal. Uh, is there a difference in, in the outcome and the, the timeliness? We have not been able to, to ascertain that because it's, it's really um, six and one apples and oranges. They've both been on time. They've both been late uh, for different reasons. I, I do not. Um, and what are the benefits to the other delivery method? 
if, if it was a, a, even a smaller project where it was just maybe cement work that was being uh, laid out, maybe the job order contract would work. Uh, but I really don't. Uh, I really don't think it's 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 a, a method for this this smaller project uh, where there would be benefits that I could quantify for you and say, hey, we, you know, we we believe that we can save fifteen percent or even five percent if we were to go with this method versus the other method. Very clearly, the competitive seal proposal allows local contractors to compete with outside uh, contractors. And the, uh, well, the, the money stays here for the community as part of the economic development effort. But it's, it's, it's a board decision, and I'll go any way the board wants. Okay? But that is our recommendation for the economic development agreement. And to touch on what Mr. Overfeld said, because in the past, we had contractors that go over by six months. I mean, that, that's a whole lot. And we're looking at a gymnasium that hopefully in one year's time, students can benefit from that. Um, and so I, I do hope that in the process that once the bids are submitted and they're open, that we can consider, you know, what delays some of these contractors have had in the past, because that becomes an issue. And I know that, you know, we were, you know, we have a certain day to move into a new school, and it was delayed by, I mean, half a year, and that, that creates major problems. Um, and so we want to start, hopefully, at the, at the beginning of the school year, that it's all finished and it's then done, done, but with that stipulation that. If we do have contractors that have, in the past, have shown to be late in completing whatever projects that we certainly consider, you know, uh, an alternate. There, there's a list there of, of the methods we've done. Like I said, we haven't done any with competitive bill, uh, bidding, uh, which is just uh, sealed, and it's just the lowest bidder. And we just don't do that, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not good. Really, I don't know any district that does that, but those are the uh, projects that we've done with the competitive seal proposal. The Buena Vista campus re-roofing, Delray High School restroom and concession stand for the softball field, the high school uh, pavement for softball and soccer field, Delray Middle School synthetic track, freshman campus gym and dressing room renovations, freshman campus re-roofing, Garfield Elementary new campus, North Heights Elementary additional renovations, San Felipe Moore Middle School additional uh, additions and renovations, the Bank and Trust Ramp Field, the Transportation Depot, uh, the Walter Leverman uh, Stadium seating expansion, uh, and then the construction manager at risk, you can see uh, where there are uh, maybe projects that are bigger in scope, Delray High School New Science Lab, the additions and renovations and new gym at Lamar, uh, and the Ruben Chavita Elementary additions and renovations and new gym. Um, none with the construction manager agent and none with the design build contract. Did the gym, obviously? Yes, I, that was a whole. It was a whole. It was a whole project on the campus, and that was uh, that was a pretty big one. And we went competitive seal proposal. So, if actually, let's say we go with a competitive um, seal proposal. What are the options? And I'm talking in terms of uh, past experience that we have had for, the, for that particular company. Do you take that into consideration? Yes. The uh, timeliness. How reliable is that company, in other words, from Absolutely. a financial standpoint? To, so it's not just because they're low that we're going to take them. Absolutely. So that would be competitive bidding where we just took the lowest bid. But on competitive sale proposal, we're able to just put uh, uh, the safety record of the company timeliness that they've come in in other projects with ourselves, uh, just everything uh, that we need to consider in there. Um, if it's the wishes of the board, uh, I can definitely provide the, the, the scoring system uh, before we use it uh, so that everybody can be comfortable with it. No, I'm comfortable with it. I, I just wanted to, because I'm familiar with it and I just wanted everybody
consideration to approve the competitive seal proposal as a construction delivery method for the construction of the Buena Vista Elementary Gymnasium project. It is a recommendation of the administration that the San Felipe Del Rio CISD Board of Trustees approve the competitive seal proposal as a construction delivery method for the construction of the Buena Vista Elementary Gym Project. Okay. Further recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita has motion, Ms. Lozano has second. All in favor, by a show of hands, it's unanimous, motion carries. It brings us to Agenda item 8B, consideration to approve first reading policy update 96, affecting local policies EFAA and FEB. Again, Dr. Rios present. There are three policies uh, that update 96 addresses. The third policy, we have not received a clear direction from TASB, so we pulled it and we only included uh, the two policies. Uh, that are outlined here. Uh, very briefly, I will share with you that the first policy, EFAA, has to do with the instructional materials allotment. And uh, as best as, as we could ascertain, there's only one major change. And it just says that in terms of the committee that improves the instructional materials allotment, it no longer has to be composed primarily of classroom teachers. Now, that's what the policy says, and we'll keep. Um, We'll keep in line with, with, with the verbiage for the policy, but we uh, clearly intend to continue to use teachers uh, as members of the uh, committee. The second policy can um, have a specific time for recording the attendance. It no longer has to be just at one time. So by campus, we could say the official reporting attendance for North Heights will be this hour, and the official reporting attendance for uh, Calderon will be this hour. <coughs> now, clearly, as a district, we intend to move together and have the same bell schedule because of transportation and everything else. But again, uh, the policy dictates that we have uh, some leeway in that, uh, and we're just having our policy reflect that. Now, the practices are going to be to be consistent throughout uh, the district. The first reading of your questions or the re the recommendation. Yeah. No it's a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the first reading of revisions uh, to EFAA and FEB. Okay, we've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt is motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carries. Okay, that brings us to agenda item 8C. Consideration approved first reading revision to BE local policy. Dr. Rios presenting. And as discussed during the team of eight training, the board meetings had started at 6 Was time to change that in policy. That will be the only change to be local, which indicates a start time of the board meetings at 6 p.m. versus 7 p.m. So this one's pretty simple. Uh, we discussed at the workshop. I actually went back and looked at the records, and it seems like in July we had discussed leaving it at 6, seeing if it fit everyone's schedule. And so it's been you know, nine months, 11 months, something like that. So it's time to, to formalize it if everybody wants to do that. Any questions? Any discussion? Okay. Recommendation? It's a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the first reading of revisions to BE local policy as presented. Sure. All in favor by a show of hands. <coughs> Unanimous. Motion carries. Brings us to discussion action item 8E. Consideration to approve submission of application for the 2013-14 SAS <coughs> Special Education E-Grant application for federal funding to the appropriate headquarter authority. Dr. Deanna, get it presented. 
uh, Mr. Getter Obedian, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. We have received our entitlement amounts, our tentative entitlements for our Idea B formula and our Idea B preschool. Uh, in the Idea B formula, our tentative amount entitlement is $1,518,993. Idea B preschool, our tentative amount is 47962 with a total of $1,566,955. Are there any questions that I can answer? Discussion? No? Ready for the recommendation? The recommendation? It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of T Trustees approve the submission of the special education e-grant application for the federal special education to the appropriate headquarter authority for the 2013-2014 year as presented. We've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita's motion, Mr. Mesa has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unless motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to 8F. Consideration to approve submission of application for 2013-14 SAS Carl Perkins e-grant application for federal funding to the appropriate headquarter authority. Mr. Roger Gonzalez presenting. Good evening, Mr. Garbidian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. In compliance with the Educational Code 44.002 and 44.006 in the Texas Law 2.2 through 2.6 budget sections, the application for the Carl Perkins grant is being presented in the amount of planning amount of $124,122. Questions? Or the recommendation? It is a recommendation of the administration for CTE programs at Del Rio High School to the appropriate headquarter authority for the 2013 2014 year as presented. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt has motion. Ms. Lozano has second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion Thank carries. You. Thank you. Agenda item 8G, consideration to approve the contracted services agreement with Education Service Center Region 15 for the 2012-13 year. Mr. Garbidian, uh, Dr. Rios, uh, members of the board. Each year, the district contracts Region 15 for specific services for the upcoming year. Dr. Garza, one, one moment. We just, that's why I paused when I said it, I, just for clarity. The agenda item said 12-13 year. We're talking about the 13-14 year, right? Because that's what the memo says. Right. On the actual memo, it does say okay. 12. Just 13, for clarity, 14. that was a typo on the agenda item. But we're talking about 13-14 year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Each year, the district contracts Region 15 for specific services for the upcoming year, the 2013-2014. The following itemized lists are the contracts for which the administration plans to utilize the services of Region 15 for the 2013-2014 year. The first one is Cisco for an itemized uh, amount of 73865 Now, this might change. Uh, I did talk to Mr. Scott Gowen this morning to make sure that I had a right figure since Cisco has changed a little bit. He doesn't know the exact number, but he did give me a figure of uh, five dollars but it's not accurate until they vote on the 24th of june the executive directors will meet in austin and they will have a finalized uh, amount there dr rios the school district will get a, a an actual amount at that now it's seven dollars per student it comes out to about 70 no 68,000 plus the six thousand it comes out to 73 I'm just giving you a basic number of what Mr. Gowen told me. It's not 100% accurate. I'm just telling you the difference between the um, $5 and $7. It's about $48,000. That difference is the amount, $48,000. Okay. 
So what's we're asking for approval. Um, we will not exceed the same amount that we paid last year, and obviously we will make every effort uh, to negotiate uh, a reduced price from last year because of a limited um, scope of sea scope. Unfortunately, uh, because of the time of the year we're in, we do not have another option to see scope. Uh, had, you know, had we been planning for uh, one year, we might come up with another option. Now, we're committed to, uh, as, soon as, as soon as we negotiate the price, start looking and start considering uh, other uh, curriculum uh, providers. But in our experience, we've looked at others uh, and – and right now, those that we've looked at are not affordable. And I, I don't want to disparage Pearson, uh, but they have a very nice product, but it's very expensive, uh, almost uh, not affordable for our district, our size. If we were rich in Title I funds like some of our neighbors to the south, then we could go with something as flashy as Pearson and not worry about it because we're using Title I dollars to pay for it. But we're not in that situation. We're not Title I rich. The next one on the uh, on the list is uh, distance learning co-op at $2,500, gifted and talent cooperative, $10,300, discovery education, $24,237.50, instructional services cooperative, $42,432.50, lights, light speed filtering services, $18,000, Net 15 Network Services, 1250 Star One, 33325 uh, Data Management uh, for Assessment and Curriculum, 44750 Destiny Resources Cooperative, 9436 9, 9, And PEAMS Cooperative, $2,500 for a Destiny Resources Cooperative. Destiny Resources is a program software that we use for the check-in, check-out of books the librarians use. Other questions? Discussion? Ms. Bosano? Are there any items that are new this year? Um, no, ma'am, there is not. One of the items, DMAC, we are asking several other uh, items that uh, we did not have last year. For example, the SIP for CIP creation for Campus Improvement Plan. We are using that. And also we're purchasing the ITI uh, software, too, for DMAC. I'm sorry. Uh, didn't we house uh, Destiny before? So isn't that an addition? Right. What we're going to do now is, and I wish Mr. Casillas would come out here and explain this a little bit more, we are going to house it at region in comparison to uh, actually housing it here. And I think he is better at explaining this. Yes, sir. What's the question? Destiny. Destiny. Uh, Ms. Lozano asked if there was uh, anything new on the, the proposal for the service center, the services. And I know that a cabinet, uh, you led extensive dialogue on why we should have the service center house the destiny versus us and uh, the savings that that would mean. So yes, actually, the uh, at a previous meeting with uh, Region 15 consultants, they indicated that they would uh, that they host uh, the destiny services for the surrounding districts, and we've been doing that for several years. And what that means is that we have to set up servers for each individual campus. And every time that they're... ...maintain the servers at the same time. So considering the fees that they charge, and I think it started out at $600 a year for them to host the services, and it wound up $300? $300. dollars $300 actually. So, I mean, it's, it's almost like a no-brainer to have the uh, service center host uh, the destiny services. It frees us up from having to set up our own servers, maintain them, a lot of man hours too. Ms. Bosano? Dr. Garza, you mentioned something about ITI. 
No, RTI. Oh, RTI. RTI. That is a new uh, software that we're going to get with the package of the DMAC software. With this list, sir? The reason I'm saying is because throughout the year we usually get, you know, you, you ask for other services. Mm -hmm. Are we getting them at this time, all of them? Am I making myself clear or not? Well, yes, sir. I mean, uh, in accordance to this list, I, I can tell you that we have been using everything here. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but well, we... My question, let me repeat it again, is that, uh, you know, throughout the year we, we come up with different services that, uh, that they're provided. Why don't they give us all that we can so we can get started in September 1st? Probably. Uh, we, were, we were in a discussion with them initially, and I think I understand your question, sir. The services from the region centers have changed drastically with the reduced funding. And as a result, they have cut back on staff. And so what they did is they set up a menu of items that, that school districts can subscribe to. Rather than before we used to pay uh, one large lump sum and then they would send consultants and trainers and so on. And sometimes we would use the services and sometimes we weren't, but we were paying for a large sum. And what they did is they set up a menu and we select the services that we want to, to have. And, you know, it saves us money and it, it kind of sets us on our own to do some other things. I think that, that answers. Yes, uh, yes. And, uh, and the reason I'm asking is because in case that, you know, it's amazing, and I'm talking about uh, what you hear other people are doing and that we're not doing, and I'm wondering are we actually really getting for our teachers, our principals, everything possible that we can do so we can utilize them. And, and we certainly are trying. Clearly some services that the district has gone outside of the region and even gone to Region 20 uh, because, uh, in the opinion of, of our staff, uh, they feel that Region 20 can service them either in a more timely manner or in a more comprehensive manner. Um, do we believe that to be the case for every service that Region 15 offers? Uh, no. We're, we're obviously happy with some. We do like the luxury of being able to, to shop around for the services. And ha them having the menu of items allows us to do that. Uh, just uh, to be very clear, uh, there has been different discussions entertained about recommending and exploring the possibility of, of switching service centers. Uh, since, since I've come on board in the last seven weeks, uh, I've heard it more than once about opting out of, of ex a lot uh, of exploring and it's a bold move, and, and I want to make sure that we thoroughly explore it before making that type of recommendation. There is a, a avenue to do that, but it's something that has to be well studied before we move forward with a recommendation. But in the meantime, we'll uh, shop around for the best services. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the contracts with Region 15, approve payment of the purchase order over $25,000, and pay the invoices in the total of the amount of $265,596 when they become due. Yes, I am a math teacher. Yes, former math teacher. <laughs> Everybody good? Do we need the recommendation? Okay. okay. We've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Smith says motion. Mr. Trevita has seconds. All in favor, by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 8. H, consideration to approve the superintendent administration to finalize Mr. John Rawls' negotiations with the stop loss carrier and authorize the superintendent to sign the contract as negotiated for the 2013 14 year. Ms. 
Valdez presenting. Good evening again, Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, board members. Every time at this year, uh, we bring this request to the board. Mr. Rouse, our insurance consultant, ha prepares and sends out RFPs for our district. He sent them out this year with a due date of June 21st. They were advertised in our uh, local news herald on, on May 22nd and on May 26th. Once he receives those pro uh, the responses to his proposals, he begins to negotiate to again for the best price. And when he finalizes those negotiations, the stop loss carriers only offer a short period of time for us to sign off on that approved proposal. Now the information uh, that the stop loss carriers are using is of course the latest information through our health insurance uh, fund and that is why they have such a short time frame because anything can change, you know, at, at any point in time. So what we request is that uh, we be able to, that Mr. Rawls be able to work with the superintendent and administration to either accept or reject in, in such a short period of time uh, any stop loss carrier proposals that we receive. Now last year we brought this in June and our deadline to have a stop loss carrier is August 31st and we signed off on August 30th. So the negotiations run down to the wire. That's why we, we bring this recommendation to the board. Any questions? Any discussion? Okay. okay. Recommendation. The administration recommends that the board approve the superintendent and administration to finalize Mr. Ralph's negotiations with the stop loss carrier and authorize the superintendent to sign the contract as negotiated for the 13-14 year. Further recommendation is for a motion to accept. Mr. Chavita has motion. Mrs. Lozano has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. And item 8I, consideration of approved training services with Jimmy Denning for HR, finance, and budget analysts. Ms. Valdez presenting. Mr. Denning has been the Skyward consultant uh, for many years for the school district. He is a retired Skyward employee and he did build the system and throughout the years he has been used uh, for training our employees on how to use Skyward or consulting us on Skyward processes. At this time we are requesting his services in order to um, calculate our year-end expenditure projections, and this is on the budget side. Uh, last month I did bring a request uh, to approve a contract with Skyward, but that was on the salary side for salary negotiations. Now this is on the budget side to project our year-end information so we can begin reducing our deficit, our budgeted deficit. Discussion? I think the amount is minimal, you know. It's right. He, he does an amazing job, and sometimes he doesn't charge us. <laughs> um, but he does an amazing job. He knows our school district very well, and, of course, since he was part of the creation team, he knows the system very well. Mr. Chavita. Was he the same person who sold as a coach? No, sir. He wasn't part of the sales <laughs> team. <laughs> Other discussion? It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve for the superintendent to sign the contract and authorization of payment to Jimmy Denning as presented. Further recommendation, I so move we accept. Is there a second? Mr. Overfelt is second. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to 8J, consideration to approve increase in paid student lunch prices to meet yearly district compliance with the Federal Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act of 2010. Diane Hernandez presenting. Good evening again, Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. I told you I'd be back. All right. Uh, I stand before you with the consideration to approve the increase in paid student lunch prices to meet yearly district compliance with the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act. Some background information. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was signed into law by President Barack Obama in December, actually December 13th of 2010. 
Um, it did not go into effect until the school year with July 2011, all right? So we stayed pat, pat there. So the reason strict nutritional standards were implemented at this particular time, basically it stood child nutrition and the child nutrition program on its head with all the changes because nothing had been done to the child nutrition program on a national level since the 1970s, the early 1970s. So uh, they saw the need with Michelle Obama and, and the president, the need to, to address a lot of the issues that take place with our youth today with the high diabetes rate, the obesity rate, et cetera, and unhealthy eating and more sedentary lifestyles. So a big portion of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act were changes on more fresh fruits and vegetables being required weekly, more dark green, dark orange vegetables required weekly, increase in portion sizes, half cup servings on, on fruits and vegetables, which you know we're already doing, but uh, making it mandatory that students cannot leave a line without taking a fruit or a vegetable, All right? So as a result, they saw that, yes, prices for um, contracting entities or food service authorities are naturally going to go up significantly, All right? So we saw more fresh fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, which were all whole grain across the district, low to non-fat milk, that's zero to 1%, on all. Uh, significant reduction in sodium, which has to be phased in over about 20 years to cause the, be allowing the manufacturers to be able to retool their items to get that sodium content down. And that's going to take them quite a, quite a stretch. So the focus is getting back to more fresh, natural ingredients on a massive level. Now, to offset these costs that the districts were going to have to incur, all right, it was ordered that in order to assist districts in meeting the cost of these rigorous standards, school districts were also mandated to increase the cost of paid student meals to meet a specific formula. This was so they said that federal dollars will not be paying for paid student meals. That was the mandate. Under Section 205 of the Act, they are specific, but yet nebulous, all right, which is good federal legalese. Effective for the school year beginning July 1st, 2011, and again, this is Section 205, uh, schools are required to charge students for paid meals at a price that is, on average, equal to the difference between free meal reimbursement and paid reimbursement. Schools that currently charge less are required to gradually increase their prices until they meet the requirement. Schools may choose to cover the difference in revenue with non-federal funds instead of raising meal prices. I don't think anybody wants to do that, all right? Which means that would be dipping into the general fund, all right, to cover this. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm happy to say is that this department, as the Child Nutrition Program, is one of the few that operates in the black, all right? Many, many child nutrition programs operate in the red and continue to dip into the general fund balances of their school district. We try and stay a step ahead of the game by projecting and monitoring very closely our expenditures and our revenues. Naturally, food costs and labor costs are the two largest expenditures that any food service department has. So we saw basically this year roughly a 25 to 30 percent increase in uh, food costs, okay, which also go hand in hand with increased transportation costs, labat costs, produce costs, milk costs, the whole nine yards down the line. All right, <clears throat> a bit of history. Okay, July 2007, I don't know how many of y'all were on the board in 2000, Mr. Mesa, who else was there? Several people. Okay, it was the first time in 16 years that school lunch prices were increased because we were already uh, below industry standard, below our fellow districts um, of a competitive size, below districts in, in Texas in general. So that was the first time that they were increased in 16 years. It went from a dollar forty to a dollar sixty, all right, and a dollar sixty to a dollar eighty, respectively, for elementary and secondary. Secondary receiving the larger portion size, thus indicating the higher price. All right, December 2010, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was signed. July 2011, 
paid lunch prices increased and were voted to be increased from $1.60 to $1.80, which was still under what our uh, fellow districts in the area were, and $1.80 to $2.00. All right, prices were not increased in 2012 due to the fact that there was a lot of misinformation. Remember, this stood the industry on the head. We would call region and say, well, if we increased our, our, um, our amount last year by 20, oh, you shouldn't have to do that. Well, let's call Austin, and then Austin would call Washington, and nobody seemed to know the answer. So by the time they came with the fact that, yes, you need to increase at a minimum of 10 cents every year, we were already into last year's school year, and we can't you know, have a price increase in the middle of the year. So, all right. <clears throat> the formula, if anyone's interested in the formula, the formula is the amount of the free student lunch reimbursement minus the current paid student lunch reimbursement. At present, we have $2.88, which is what we receive for a free student meal reimbursement, two eighty-eight. That's minus 29 cents, which is what we get for the paid student reimbursement. So we receive 29 cents, the student or the parent pays the remainder, okay? So you subtract 288 or 29 cents from 288 and you come up with roughly $2.59. This is a moving target because the new reimbursement rates for the upcoming school year have not been posted yet. Those are usually anywhere from five to six to maybe seven cents, depending. That will be posted in July. So. The reimbursement rate is anticipated to once again go up. So we will be chasing that target as we go along. <clears throat> All right. We are compliant. Another thing that the federal government did with this act was to mandate that you had to meet certain nutritional standards. You had to meet and exceed or whatever. You had to fill in all the boxes, dot all the I's, and make sure that you were serving uh, exactly what they required you to do. We in fact achieved that back in October and so we also received an additional six cents per lunch meal for all across the board. So we're happy to say we're compliant in that area. All right, the bottom line is is that we are mandated under Section 205 of the Healthy Hunger Feed Kids Act to provide a minimum 10% increase or 10%, 10 cent increase per year added to the paid student lunch prices. Any questions so far? Well, we'll get back. Okay. All right. What else do I have? Now, we are asking, and this is totally negotiable because the minimum is 10 cents, but one of the reasons that this department operates the way it does is the ability to project and the ability to uh, make sure that we have all of our areas covered. So, um, you want me to read the, the recommendation or? Well, no. Because we're gonna probably. You could just mention that you're asking to propose 20 cents. Right, yes. Based on upcoming projections and the increase in, in utilities, the increase in food uh, costs, transportation costs, et cetera, and the fact that we're chasing a moving target that we're probably not going to catch, but we are operating in good faith, which I think they, they look at. Uh, and it's so much misinformation out there that who knows, it may change by next year, because already several things have changed with this act as we've gone along. So every day is a new day when you, when you wake up in the morning and something exciting happens with child nutrition. So the administration, we are recommending a 20, 20 cent increase on the paid student lunch meals rather than the 10 cent. Now questions. Mr. Overfelt has a question. What's the percentage within the district that's on free lunch, free and reduced? It's roughly 74%. And out of the 26% that aren't, do you have an idea of out of that percentage who um, actually buys lunch out of the cafeteria? Actually, we have a very large paid population that participates, which I'm very proud of, which means that they actually like the food. So on a daily basis, that's our second highest number in participation is our paid students. Actually, our reduced students are our third. So we have free, paid, and then reduced. Um, going by October numbers of 2012, which are the kind of baseline for what we're looking at, 
Uh, high school, just for October, actually secondary, secondary meals. Well, we've got it broken down by totals. Secondary meals, uh, 18,427 meals were served. Elementary meals, 16,852 elementary meals. Um, for, let's see, paid, reduced, free. Let's look at high school. 7,229 paid meals, 2,229 reduced, 17,030 of uh, the free meals for that particular month. So monthly paid meals for the month of October 2012 were 35,279 paid meals. Reduced meals, 15,000. 147. Free meals, 127,208. For a total of 177,634 for the month of October. Okay. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Okay. Assuming that we approve your increase, because you mentioned earlier how what our prices were in line with neighboring districts. So assuming we approve it, how are we in line with neighboring districts? We're still a bit below, actually. I have all the figures the, the USDA sent out, actually statewide, all the, I'll now send them to y'all. Um, every school district in every state is broken out, and it gives you their meal prices. And uh, we're still low. But, you know, you have to consider the demographic, and you have to consider the area that we're in as well. So, so like, compared to Eagle Pass and Uvalde, how are we? Well, Eagle Pass is on provision, too, which is, like, it's all it's all free. Uvalde? Uh, Uvalde, I'll have to look. But they're, uh, they're a bit higher than we are, actually, if they held true to when the last time I looked at them. Comstock is extremely expensive. They're almost four bucks a, four bucks a uh, paid student lunch. So they're way up there. Is Comstock provided by the district, or is that a private company that well, now takes care it, of theirs? Yeah, it was provided by the district, but as of this past year, they went with a food service management company, a consulting company, but they were losing money, and they were taking money out of the district's general fund because they weren't generating enough revenue. So they bit the bullet, and they did like a dollar increase, and they've managed to pull themselves out to where they're, you know, at least even, breaking even by doing that increase. And more kids. The kids balked at first, and they, you know, brought their lunch, or they didn't come at all. But now they said the participation is doing pretty well in Comstock, even at that advanced price. But you know, we don't want to go there. Okay, so twenty cents then uh, a day. So that's a dollar times three kids. That's three dollars a week, right? So we're looking. My family is. Well, I look at it in terms of my child. It's like okay, that's an extra. And sh that's not including the ice cream and the Gatorade that's that's on top of all that, or, or the tea or whatever. And, and, you know, you're dealing with $2 a day. We're dealing with an additional dollar a week, okay? And that's additional, what was it, 40 If she's Yeah, she's secondary. So it would go from 40 to $44 a month. That's assuming she ate every day, which I check and I make sure <laughs> she does. Dr. Massa, you had a comment? I, I had a question. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at your recommendation, and um, I'm having trouble realizing, you know, what you mean by minimum of $0.10 cents per year, because we're going to authorize, if we vote on this favorably, it means we're going to increase by $0.10 cents every year, minimum. Correct. Correct. Could that be more than $0.10? Cents? It's, up to the, it's up to the district. It's up to, to you all to decide that. But remember, we have to show good faith that we are trying to ob obtain that target that they've set, which is a pretty lofty some, you know, but it is something that, you know, like I said, they don't want federal dollars being used for paid students' meals. Dr. Rios has something. Well, the other thing, in answer to Mr. Mess's question, we discussed this at Cabinet, and even though we're saying we're asking for approval for uh, 10 cents a year, we fully intend to bring it back to the board anytime there is an increase and give you all the opportunity to vote it up or down. So regardless of how you approve oh, yeah. it tonight, we would bring it back every year. This year, we can definitely do that. Oh, sure. Yeah, and you know, it's it's by no means a rubber stamp for every year. It's it's up to 
up to you all to decide based on the information that's given to you and any information I can, I can further give you should you, should you ask for more. More questions? I can get you. Yeah, I'll send you. No, we're looking at. Okay, great. What is it? 225 Wright Elementary. Okay. It's a secondary. 250. 250. And we're going from what now? We're going up to Michigan. Right, we would be going. Where is it? It's a free breakdown. Right. Over there. Um. Right, and we would be going from two dollars to two two dollars and twenty cents for secondary, and a dollar eighty to two dollars for elementary, should it be approved. And breakfast. Breakfast is universal for everyone. That was a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. so. Except Buena Vista. No, Buena Vista is still universal. They're just not doing the classroom thing. Right, that's this upcoming year. But no, everybody is on universal free across the are, district. Are they going to do in the yes. classroom this upcoming year? Yes. Okay. Yes, we've already met with the principal. We've already got the containers ordered. Everybody's on go. Yes, ma'am. Reduced um, would not see it an no. increase? No, reduced stays at 40 cents. That's federal. Well, that's it's a set. federal amount that's set. Yes, so that's 40 cents. So they're not touched. Free students are not touched. The only ones would be, yes, the paid student. And do visitors come in late? Excuse visitors? Me? Mm -hmm. No, that's that's significantly higher. All right, that's bumping up at three seventy five if you're a visitor and you come in. So they do pay a pay an outside price. Questions, comments, Mr. Chavita. So the one twenty to two dollars and two the two twenty is mandated. The one eighty to well, elementary. What would be mandated? What would be mandated would be a dollar eighty to a dollar ninety. Okay, that has to take place. All right, it would be from two dollars to two dollars and ten cents. That must take place as well. So, so, we're, so basically, in a very clear way, what we're required to do is to go from one eighty to one ninety. Or from what was the other? Two one? to two ten. From two to two ten. But what you're asking us is to go from one eighty to two, or two to and two to two twenty. Right? Yes. Okay. So there it is. Those, are those who don't qualify are the ones that are going to have to to pay for it. Either don't don't like it at all. That is correct. None of us will <laughs> enjoy it either. And the twenty cents as opposed to ten cents is projecting c upcoming costs cost. with food and transportation, and you know all the increase in fresh produce and the increase in whole grains and the costs that are going to be incurred, you know, by the department. Recommendation, please. All right. The administration recommends that the San Felipe del Rio CISD Board of Trustees approves the increase of current elementary paid student lunch meals from $1.80 to $2 and secondary paid student lunch meals from $2 to $2.20 to comply with the Federal Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 as presented. Further recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Mesa has motioned. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor, by a show of hands. One, two, three, four. Four all opposed. One, two. Motion carried. Thank you. And I'll send you all that information if you really want to see it. Okay, that brings us to agenda item 8K, consideration of approved contracted services of Del Rio High School and Del Rio Middle School cheerleader and Bell's tryouts. Presenter, Dr. Sally Suniga Barrera and Ida Gomez. Good evening, Mr. Garabedi and Dr. Rios, school board members. 
Mrs. Gomez and I are here for you to please consider to approve contracted services for the Delaware High School cheerleader uh, tryouts and also for the Bells tryouts as well as the Delaware Middle School cheerleader tryouts. Uh, there's a, a copy of this memo in your um, packet, page 181. The total of the budgeted amount is $1,546.92, and it would be paid out of the accounts from Delroy High School and Delroy Middle School. Are there any questions? Ms. Lozano has a question. Sure. Just for clarification, um, have we always paid judges? Yes. We have? Yes, ma'am. Well, Wait for how long? At least the seven years that I've been there, and uh, at least the seven years that I was there, and prior to that, when we were assistant principals, they were always paid. There are judges from out of town. The judges that we used were from the University of In the Incarnate Word. This time, I don't know who they used last year. Um, I, I know recently within the last, maybe it was 10 months or, or eight months there, we said that the contract stuff has to come through the board for uh, approval there. Um, the thing there on this memo, though, um, shows that this has already happened, so they've been waiting a month to, to get paid, and it's just barely coming to us. If we know every year that... <laughs> We're going to have to have judges, et cetera, stuff like that there. Why now and why didn't it come to us in, in May or um, something there? That's that's what I have a question on. I know there's others that have that same thought in their mind. Why, why after the fact, all of a sudden, this one came to us? Actually, Dr. Rios is going to address that. I think this answers both uh, Mrs. Lozano's, uh, Martinez Lozano's concern and question posed by Mr. Overfeld. Probably the reason that y'all weren't, or some of y'all may not have been aware that we use paid judges is because traditionally this is an item that would not come to the board. So the campuses have never had to do uh, or obtain board approval for something of such minimal cost. Um, so y'all wouldn't have seen it. Um, in answer to Mr. Overfeld, is, you know, they've never had to do this before in terms of bringing for board approval. This is something that according to board policy, the superintendent has been allowed to sign off on and move forward. Now, within the last few months, uh, probably in the conversations that I've had with the staff, it's just been recently where the board uh, has approved every contact, contract regardless of the expense. Uh, policy says, state policy says $50,000. Uh, doesn't have to, below $50,000, it doesn't have to come to the board. A local policy says $25,000 and below doesn't have to come to the board. In the past, that had been the practice. Now, the board had set a limit. Maybe the superintendent can spend up to $10,000 uh, per vendor or $15,000. Uh, I would like the board to consider us either following uh, a policy where, where I make those uh, uh, agreements uh, or that the board give me some direction to say, well, uh, Dr. Reels, we're comfortable with you spending up to $15,000. But something that doesn't delay the process uh, in having to get people paid or expedite uh, contracted services that we might determine are needed within those 30 days. Um, so uh, I just need direction from the board, uh, and that's why we're so late on this. It was um, some good questions, but I think we ought to go back to what you're saying. Because... Uh, you know, we've done it before, and I think, uh, you know, we should rely on our superintendent to make those decisions. Ms. Uh, not that I don't think we should rely on you, Dr. Rios. Um, um, just historically, the transparency was not there. 
there were questions regarding contracts out there that no one really was aware of that perhaps did surpass the amount that should have come to the board. So how do we prevent that from happening again? And in this case, it's not that, from my perspective, I don't see it as trying to micromanage anything. I don't have time to do that. However, if, it's, if you know you're going to require this well in advance, then there, there shouldn't be a rush of anything. So it could simply just be as an FYI item so that we're aware of it instead of requiring the approval, just reporting. One, one other option, uh, one other option that, that, uh, that we considered was moving uh, approval of these this to, to provide some further research and guidance on this so we can move all these contracts to a consent agenda item versus a presentation um, and make it uh, uh, quicker now it still doesn't take the, the, the burden off of us and then have an agreement with the board I've had to do two services in the past where I update you on uh, our Friday board updates just because of the timeliness and what we have to implement so we can have that agreement we'll try to be as transparent that when I cannot put it on a consent agenda because it's within those 30 days, then then I provide it in a board update. But whenever possible, we'll put it on a consent agenda if it's under the under the 25,000. Uh, would, would that meet the the, the spirit of, of, of being open? Over 25,000 or no, under 25,000? Over 25,000, we clearly, clearly have to bring it as a discussion item. I know, uh, Yanakani, that at one point we, I had asked that we have a place where we know who we have contracts with. Yes, ma'am, a centralized file location. The process that was established since those last events was that all contracts come to my office. I ensure that they come to the board and obtain the signature of the superintendent and they're filed in my office. What the second level of approval, or not approval, but the second level check level is that once they go to the accounting office, they are sent a copy and they don't pay off on those contracts unless they have a copy that's received from my office. That way they know that it did follow the correct procedure that we've had in practice. And you maintain all those contracts somewhere? Yes, they're in my office. No, because my staff won't pay them, <laughs> and they won't. <laughs> so that's a process we have maintained uh, in practice. Okay, ju just for uh, clarity, you know, the, the item is about paying these people. But what's been brought up is very clearly about organizational leadership and governance. And just a reminder, within about a year, we've had three superintendents. Exited, Dr. Rios and Mr. Cooper before that. So at, at each time, there's kind of a different way of, of managing those things. Dr. Rios has put out a couple of good possibilities, expanding the consent agenda and through the board updates. So I think that's really something the board comes back, you know, and has those discussions individually with him about what their comfort level is and, and what will work. Well, Dr. Chibita. see, but you were, you, you point out uh, we don't want to mic wait on microphone manage the, uh, the uh, office, but sometimes we, we do because here we are. Policy says that we're, that contracts under a certain amount, we don't let them know. We, we, it's like um, hiring. The only ones that we do is the contracts, teachers, and, the and there's a lot of, of staff that is being hired without us knowing. Why? Because it's, it's, that's policy. And, and this is why a lot of times I've seen other, uh, uh, when I'm discussing you on, on the board, me, I mean, uh, functions we go to, we ask uh, the board members, how long will you board your, your times in there? He says, we got three hours. He says, so we, we got an hour and a half. Why? Because we got, we go through a lot of things that we shouldn't. And I 
hate to say it, but that's the way it is. And anyway, if, uh, if, if we could find a way of just letting us know, that was fine. We don't have to go through the whole detail here. Because here we're only spending about 30 minutes on this. And not that I mind being here. The only thing, the only reason, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is there's, there's a lot of things that, that we hire a superintendent to take care of. to interject something. Originally, the problem was that there were some contracts that were out there that no one knew about. In other words, it might have initiated a campus, and then another campus might have joined, and they had some contracts going with certain companies. And, and so that's what initiated, I think, Dr. Ackerman to, to exactly. put some clarity in there and say, you know what, those contracts need to be approved by the board. And so we now have our superintendent that um, I think – you know, what he's proposing would be just fine with me as long as, you know, we get the information because I, I, I think that's what initially created, you know, some questions, you know, from board members and it wasn't um, done um, like at every campus, but there were some contracts out there that had been initiated and so, you know, that, that no one knew about. If, if it's, uh, if it pleases the board, I'll spend some time with our conversations uh, with with y'all, uh, and then bring uh, a formal practice that will be <coughs> that one provides transparency because I committed to providing transparency when when y'all hired me, but that also provides for the efficiency of running uh, the district in, in, in a way that does justice to everybody. Can we, yeah, can we dispense with the other recommendations? Sorry. <laughs> um, no, and I understand we had already made our. We're going to do this there's, beforehand. There's a larger issue at play. That's exactly. So but give us a recommendation. If there's no questions on the actual item. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approves the superintendent to sign the contract and authorization of payment as requested. Okay, we've heard the recommendation. I so move to accept. Is there a second? Ms. Haynes has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carries. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, that brings us to 8L, correct? Consideration to approve contracted services for Del Rio Freshman, Del Rio Middle School, Sapphire's routines. Mr. Nanya is presenting. some uh, instructors that come in the month of July. Actually, the date is July the 8th through the 11th, and they provide a, a camp for W students that will learn dance field and stand routines with uh, teaching emphasis on dance technique as vocabulary and also vocabulary um, for the students. Uh, the instructors are Mrs. Elizabeth Lopez Sanchez. She's currently the instructor specialist of dance and theater, Northside, Ms. Jacqueline Aguirre, Dance Director of Brandeis High School, um, and also Ms. Angela Pina, currently the Pep Director of the Warren High School, and also, and also Northside. It's a, um, the fees uh, cover their hotel, the mileage, the meals, uh, schedule of all the events for the students, and this is a really a, a very nece uh, necessity for a program as it's continuing to grow in our middle school dance classes and uh, also the uh, Freshman Sapphires. Um, it's pretty much, uh, they also have a couple of uh, spirit directors will receive training on fundraising, team goal settings, parental communication skills. Um, we've, we've been doing this for the past three years. It's been a very, very successful program, summer program. Does anybody have any questions? Posano, a question. Yeah, Mr. Nunez, um, this is actually to put on a camp for the students. Is it to train your instructors? Um, it's a combination of both. 
actually with use, utilizing the current students that are going to be in, in those programs because they're performing groups and also the, uh, the like the Sapphire's group itself comes in, we make it a, a semi-mandatory slash vacation uh, with the understandings and appearances as we can. But uh, the majority of them have been instructed and been told before this uh, uh, before we broke off this summer. And uh, so it's it's all, all it's all hands on, and, and it's very productive. And is this something typically that's paid by the district or paid by the student to participate in the camp? No, we we, we have paid it from the district. Okay. Our, our funds. It can't be mandatory. Don't we compete UIL wise? Uh, well, uh, well, we did check with UIL as well, and uh, the. Um, a lot of districts and throughout the state have this camps going on. It's not only it's not only uh, the pep squad or the uh, this or the, uh, the you know we have drum major um, um, drill leaders, uh, brass brass camps, well, even woodwinds, marching specialists, uh, color guard auxiliaries. So all those we have checked already, and, and if we go side by side. There's no really no restrictions or anything as to or for for this kit this camps to take place. Aren't summer camps usually paid? So yes or no? depends on the activity. For fine arts, they usually are not, uh, even in other districts, because fine arts, even though it's a UIL competition, does not follow the same strict guidelines that the UIL handbook has for athletic competitions. Correct. Uh, so that's why in fine arts, typically is paid uh, by the districts, sometimes by booster organizations, but they're allowed. Whereas for athletic camps, we are not in any way, shape, or form allowed to pay for the students during the summer. Or really provide any type of camp, yeah. even during the school year. I was just thinking they were going to come next and ask us. So. Yeah, but we're not allowed by UIL rules. For us, for fine arts, we are. And we did check with the UIL Thank you. office. Yes. Mr. Nunez, yes. it says here below, uh, the no side dance group. Is this, uh, this where they go on, or are they coming up here? Uh, I didn't understand. The uh, contact with the chest list is below from Northside. Um, are these students or? No, no, no. They're, they're, they're professional uh, dance instructors for, from their district. So uh, in fact, uh, they're working for Northside district. Right. In fact, uh, the, the Elizabeth Sanchez, uh, she just finished conducting a workshop at, uh, at the T, uh, Setfield Conference for all the TEKS and all this. So she'll share all that information along with, with her instructors. the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approves for the superintendent to sign the contract and authorization of payment as presented. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt is motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all. Agenda item 8M, consideration to approve the submittal of the Head Start written plans and procedures. Ms. Linda Wanawato, web presenting. Mr. Garbidian, Dr. Rios, board members. In February, we had our federal review. And within that review, under section 1304.52, human resource management, K, staff and volunteer health, one, a uh, grantee and delegate agency must assure that each staff member has an initial health examination, which also included screening for tuberculosis. On uh, April 16, there was a conference call with the regional office with Michelle Humke, program specialist, and Carmen Williams, grantee specialist. At that time, there was a recommendation ba made by both Michelle and Carmen <coughs> that we have written plans and procedures for both the health screening and tuberculosis. Mr. Uh, Roger Molano, LVN, and Assistant Selena Salas met with the ASAC committee, which is the Health Safety Advisory Committee on May the 8th, and established such policies and procedures. On May 9th, the written plans and procedures were presented to the Policy Council and they were approved by the Policy Council. Uh, once approved by the Policy Council, they come to the board for your approval as well. So in your packet, you have 
the written plans and procedures as submitted by Mr. Roger Mulano, Selena Salas, with the advisory of the Health Safety uh, Advisory Board. And the Health Safety Advisory Board consists of local health specialists, United Medical, Dr. Voss, and other uh, doctors in the area. Does the TB screening, the, um, talks about staff and volunteer? Yes. Um, is the applicant required to pay for that themselves or no. are we going to? No, Head Start pays for it. Head Start is going to yes, cover sir. that. And every member, every staff member Remember. has to have, uh, including not just staff members, but our bus drivers, mm -hmm. district bus drivers also have to have a TB screen. TB. Yes. Other discussion? Okay, the recommendation. Can you, did you have something? The recommendation, please. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the submittal of the attached written plans and procedures for 1304.54 K1 as presented. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Mesa has motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carries. Brings us to agenda item 8N, consideration of approved agreement between Southwest Texas Junior College and San Felipe Del Rio CISD for career and technical education dual credit courses, technical dual credit courses. Mr. Gonzalez presenting. Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, members of the board, again, I come to you to expand our career and technical education courses that are offered at Del Rio High School. Uh, the first section that you see on there is to reactivate some of the automotive dual credit classes that were initially started a couple years ago. Uh, the, we had a visit from the junior college to look at the facilities, look at the equipment, and uh, they have approved for us to um, join, a, join them in the fall semester by offering automotive brake systems, automotive electrical systems, automotive engine performance analysis for a total of 12 hours in the automotive technology field. Also, uh, in conjunction and, and networking with the, the representatives from the junior college, we are expanding our welding program, which is a, a great need and a very popular program at Duro High School. The welding program, uh, there are three classes, the gas metal arc welding, the introduction to shield and metal arc welding, and the introduction to blueprint reading for welders. Again, a total of 12 hours the students will actually obtain their uh, hours after a full year of uh, taking the particular class. As you can see that the first one is actually automo automotive technology and the second one is actually welding. These are mainly for uh, junior students. Uh, in addition, we already had the law enforcement uh, class offered for an entire year. This is your law enforcement one class. Students were actually obtaining credit, and they were only obtaining the introduction to criminal justice after the end of the year. And we uh, talked to the representatives at the junior college, and we expanded where the students can actually obtain six hours now by actually getting credit first semester in the introduction to criminal justice and second semester for the uh, course title Use of Force. So we're expanding our dual credit classes at the high school. This makes uh, a total of 18 dual credit courses that are offered through career and technical education. And there's about 318 students that actually are requesting dual credit classes through CTE for next year. That's quite an achievement, quite mm -hmm. an Absolutely. increase. Absolutely. That's great. Especially in the technical area with Eagle Ford Shell, the need for welders, the demand. And we've heard that the welding setup is it is. It's very. We're very proud of all our programs through CT. Mr. Mesa? Well, you just said what I wanted to say, and it's wonderful, but I just want to applaud your efforts for adding uh, more dual credit courses. Um, there, there was a time, you know, last year that we deleted instead of added, and so I, I, I'm grateful for that, and, and also to kind of echo on what uh, uh, Mr. Garabedian said, uh, that Welders are in high demand, and I think uh, it's going to increase 
And uh, I'm glad that we have so many young people taking advantage of that. And I have heard some really success stories from some of the, some of the young people. Um, in fact, just today, um, at Foot Rockers, one of the employees there said, "My son graduated and he's certified. He was he was third in state welding." And so, very positive comments, you know, from um, the public out there that uh, you know they're doing great. And I, I, I'm glad they're taking advantage of these courses. And Thank again, you. I applaud your efforts for adding these Thank you. courses. Appreciate it. Ms. Lozano. Mr. Gonzalez, um, obviously, students are interested in this program. How are we prepared to accommodate more students? How many can we accommodate now? We're actually looking at, uh, actually the challenge is the welding program. The uh, facilities and equipment sometimes limit us to the number of students that are actually are taking. We have uh, 51 students in two two-hour blocks that are actually requesting it, which we can accommodate. Uh, we have 67 requests for an introduction uh, class that's coming up. So I know that in the future we are talking with the administration to actually expand some of those programs. I know that in both particular programs we do have the certifications along with the dual credit. So it's a big plus uh, for, for the students to actually enroll in, in uh, that particular uh, class. If, I'm, if I may add, with the uh, passing of HB5, which we'll, we'll update you probably in the next board meeting of how significant this is, there is uh, f uh, five endorsements that are critical in this. I know that Mr. Gonzalez has done a good job in getting certifications, but we're going to take a step further. And I know Ms. Dr. Rios and I have talked a little bit about what would be the next step. I know it's future, but uh, we do see this area expanding. And we are in critical need for the next five years to figure out we're gonna, what we're going to do specifically with these endorsements that are coming up with HB5. But I'll let uh, Dr. Rios expand a little bit if you would. We have visited uh, uh, CT instructors because there is a need for space. And in particular with welding, we've talked about how we can purchase additional equipment uh, high price equipment that we'll be bringing to the board as part of the budget process. There's also a need to expand on the facility there. However, I'm reluctant to recommend an expansion to that facility without having the board or without having given the board the opportunity to fully study other areas where the district can expand uh, because if we're it, it, it would be uh, it would show a lack of responsibility on my part to recommend an expansion that'll cost forty, fifty thousand dollars in that area there, and then later come to find out that really the board might have considered a CTE magnet school, for example. Well, we just wasted forty, fifty thousand dollars. So I'd rather that we get through the budget process here in August, and that uh, through a budget, I'm sorry, through a construction work site, we explore all these areas of need for the district. And then if at the time the decision is that maybe we can't move towards a CTE magnet, well, then we can consider uh, investing dollars in the current facilities, uh, understanding that the dollars that we invest would be appropriate uh, to service kids for the next 10, 15 years. But I really want the board to first exp uh, consider a complete expansion of the CT program in a magnet uh, type setting. Are we currently turning students away? Maybe I misunderstood you. Uh, we, do ha we do have, right now, uh, we are working with as many as we can. We're trying to actually uh, put them in, in different programs along CTE and actually uh, working in that way. I know uh, welding is actually a very popular course, and uh, we are trying to keep as many as we can. But with limited facilities and limited instructor and equipment, you know, that might be a possibility. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chavita has a question. In, uh, Roger, uh, one thing that we need to do is finally uh, let the community know what's, what we have, because we have a wonderful program. As a matter of fact, I used to hear comments from, uh, and I invited uh, our new superintendent to go out there with a, we have a breakfast club, mm -hmm. and they were always saying, hey, why don't we do this until one of them visit our, well, not just one, two or three of them visit our, our CTE program, CTE program, and they were very much impressed. So maybe we can find some way of, 
spending. Mr. Chavira, this is one of the main things that I have actually targeted this year in marketing of our programs. I think the News Herald is actually uh, a very powerful tool for expansion of the programs. I think if, uh, as I start getting in my role as a CT director, it's important for me to actually market the programs and actually become familiar with the programs. So I have been doing that along with the required advisory meeting. The advisory meeting is actually made um, actually aware for for all the community members to join and we are going to develop what is called a district advisory committee for CTE to actually give us more guidance as far as the direction that that we need to take in the future Other questions comments okay the recommendation it is a recommendation of the administration of the Board of Trustees to approve the superintendent of schools to sign the agreement with Southwest Texas Junior College as presented. Further recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Mesa has motion. Mr. Overfelt is second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Brings us to O. Consideration to approve the title and pay grade conversion for the following positions. Senior Student Services Coordinator position, Student Intervention Parental Involvement Officer, and Budget Clerk. Says the presenter is Dr. McManera, but Dr. Rios will. I just want to, to provide this discussion with the board. Over the last six weeks, we've studied uh, the positions uh, within the administrative organization that would allow us to better provide for the needs of the districts and the students. And these are two areas that I've identified uh, where we can provide better services to the students by bringing in uh, a person with, with a certain type of experiences. And I'm talking about the Senior Student Services Coordinator position. Uh, over the last few years, that position grew uh, to encompass a lot more duties than what we traditionally knew as a Student Services Coordinator, which back when we were assistant principals, uh, it was pretty much the handbook and hearings, uh, and that was it. Now that position, uh, senior student services coordinator, you know, should deal with with counselors and a counseling program, uh, expanded registration, uh, still uh, the handbook, uh, and, and a number of other duties. And it really requires a person that has certain experiences uh, to the extent of even a campus administrator. I want to keep those duties within that position, but I know that I need to have that as, as a, a, a pay grade that's measured uh, to something that would entice people to apply for that position. So I'm making that recommendation. With the student intervention and parental involvement officer, uh, we want to put somebody in that position uh, who can definitely guide uh, the activities of, of the district, uh, manage the parent specialist, parental aids are things what we call them in this district, as well as provide uh, certain trainings. Uh, I'll ask Anna Kanye to come to the podium before Dr. Mara, Dr. McNamara reads the recommendation uh, and talk about the budget clerk position. Now, all these positions are vacant positions that we're advertising uh, to fill. Uh, for the budgeting department, we currently have two budget clerks and one budget analyst. And as we're evolving with the Skyward uh, software that we use, I'm trying to move my staff to be more efficient and effective and wouldn't require a budget clerk, so we're, I'm asking for that conversion for a budget analyst in order to emphasize more on the an analyst side of budgeting versus just data entry. I was going to wait uh, to bring these positions to you as part of the budget process, uh, but frankly, if I was to wait until August and the advertising of the positions, would put me into August uh, before I could, even September, before I could hire somebody. And if I really want somebody, at least for the first two, with, with, with a certain type of experience, the domino effect that it would create would entirely disrupt uh, uh, the beginning of the school year and the leadership of, of those positions. That's why I'm bringing these ahead of time. Any discussion? Questions? Good evening, Mr. Garavidian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. It is a recommendation of the administration that the title and pay grade conversions, as outlined by Dr. Rios this evening, be approved as presented. 
For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt has motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the agenda item 8P, consideration to approve the adoption of district vision and goals. There is um, a memo in your, not a memo, but uh, information sheet in your packet. This, of course, is resultant from the workshop that we conducted a few weeks back, or Region 15 conducted for us a few weeks back, which was part of our <coughs> Tier 2 um, requirements. District vision statement and the proposed goals. That's exactly uh, where we, we left it when there was a good amount of discussion for, for three hours. Looking at, I believe that's a, was part of the email that the region sent, right, that, that you sent out in the board packet. Now it's here. I also put it uh, just maybe a little easier. Uh, also put it on this individual sheet. Let me take a look at it. Because on the one in the packet, it's a little more in-depth because it takes into consideration expanding the district goals out into superintendent goals and then performance goals. But what we're looking at is our role in terms of the IE process, the institutional effectiveness process, the vision, and the district goals. Uh, the vision statement proposed that we were comfortable with from the workshop was that the San Felipe Del Rio Consolidated Independent School District provides a safe and nurturing environment where all students become contributing citizens prepared to compete and excel in an ever-changing world. And then uh, we and the presenters develop the proposed district goals, uh, three of them, the first being the district shall maintain a safe environment, utilize quality curriculum and diverse instructional opportunities to ensure student achievement at the highest standards of excellence. Number two being the district shall be a good steward of the community's resources, financial, human facilities, and explore new opportunities for organizational efficiency and effectiveness. And three, the district shall provide meaningful and effective communication in a timely manner to all parents, students, staff, and district partners. So, uh, like I said, that's that's where we left it. That's where everybody was comfortable and, and in agreement from that workshop. Discussion? Comments? Is it just me, or is, should there not be a comma after utilized quality curriculum on the first district goal? Yeah. Should not have a comma, right? That's why I think, it, it should not have a comma. C and I. Mm -hmm. C and I think I? Dr. Garza should know the answer to that. I got my stuff back here. <laughs> Yeah, we say 2000. Should not have a comma, right? Okay. I don't think so. Okay. okay. I think that's. I think other than that. So. Make sure it's grammatically correct. Yes, we will. We will. Before we print it. Out. Yeah, before it goes up. And and if approved, right? This is what goes up on the board behind us. But most importantly, uh, you know, it's the vision of the district as we see it, as we hope to see it, and more importantly still. Those are the large district goals that the board wants to see, and then the superintendent comes back and creates very specific performance goals. I know Mr. Mesa had mentioned about early childhood and things like that, and Mr. Chavita about the attendance. And so those will be coming out of those in, uh, in the next couple of months. So with that said, I, you know, I, I recommend that, uh, that the San Felipe Del Rio CISD proposed vision statement and district goals be adopted as the official vision statement and district goals as presented. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt is motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Okay, unanimous motion carries. And we will make that comma correction. Make sure it's correct. Okay, it's now 9.21 p.m. June 17th, 2013. And the board will now recess this open 
session and convene the closed meeting in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, Subchapter D and E. We're able to do that under 551.071, 551.072, 551.073. Specifically tonight, our closed session pertains to 551.074, discussion of personnel to hear complaints against personnel, with the first item being discussion of new hires, new assignments, district vacancies, and reassignments, the second being discussion of administrator and professional contracts, and the third being discussion of salary adjustments to include but not limit to the following justifications, master's degree, service credit, and mechanic, and four, discussion of approval of principal at North Heights Elementary School. We're also able to do that under 551.076 and 551.082 and 551.084. All final votes, actions, or decisions will be taken in open meeting. We're now in closed session. It's now 11, 11 p.m., June 17, 2013. And the board will now reconvene in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code Chapter 551, Subchapter D&E. No action was taken in closed session. Now that we're reconvened into open session, brings us to Agenda Item 10, actually Agenda Item 11, the discussion action items. Under A being the first, consideration to approve new hires, new assignments, district vacancies, and reassignments, Dr. Patty McManera presenting. Good evening, Mr. Garabini and Dr. Rios, members of the school board. The administration recommends the following new hires for employment in our district. Start with Marisa Soto, physical education teacher at San Felipe Memorial Middle. Next, we'd like to respectfully recommend Priscilla Pettis, third grade teacher, Buena Vista Elementary. Next, Tyrell Lamar McRae. Uh, MAPS teacher at Delro High School. We also have the following recommendations for consideration this evening. Ms. Flora Romo, pre-K teacher at Irene Cardwell Elementary. Selena Montes, pre-K teacher also at Irene Cardwell Elementary School. Cecilia Gonzalez, kinder bilingual teacher, North Heights Elementary School. Mary Hankins, fourth grade teacher at North Heights Elementary School, and Trish, Trisha, excuse me, Garcia, third grade teacher at North Heights Elementary. We also have a music teacher, Ms. Marisa Romanos at Femin Calderon Elementary. Okay, we've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita has motioned. Is there a second? Mr. Overfelt has second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. Brings us to B, consideration to approve the administrator and professional contracts. Okay. The administration would like to recommend the following uh, administrator and professional contracts for Libana Millinder and Patricia Rodriguez as discussed in closed executive session. Further recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt is motion. Ms. Lozano has second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Brings us to C. Consideration of approved salary adjustments to include but not limit to the following master's degree, service credit, mechanic. All right. It is a recommendation of the administration that the salary adjustments for the master degree uh, individual, Ms. McClellan, the service credit for Coach Hefner, and the mechanic, uh, salary adjustments be approved as presented in closed executive session this evening. Further recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita has motioned. Is there a second? Mr. Overfelt to second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. And finally, it brings us to 11D, consideration of approved principal at North Heights Elementary School. Okay. Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, and members of the board, the administration at this time would like to recommend for your consideration this evening <coughs> Ms. Rufina Ruby Adams for principal at North Heights Elementary School. Per the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita has motioned. Is there a second? 
Ms. Lozano has second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous, motion carries. Thank you, have a great evening. Ms. Lozano, did you have a comment? I, I just wanted to take this uh, time to say thank you to my vessels for holding down the fort and doing a great job at uh, recruiting, interviewing, and making those recommendations so that the new principal there at North Heights gets started with a full complement of teachers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Brings us to agenda item 12. Being no further business before this board, is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. Overfelt is motion. Ms. Haynes has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned.